For much of the year, this two-mile super speedway is quiet and peaceful. But when men like Mario Andretti take the wheel, the scream of the racing engine splits the air, and Michigan International becomes racing's fastest track. Mario's fastest lap here last year stands as the quickest in any car history. Ford Cosworth powered that lap, and Nigel Mansell's win here a year ago, and the pole here today. At the 500 at Indy, Mercedes-Benz was the engine to own. It produced raw speed. Operating under USAC rules that allowed the purpose-built pushrod engine, Al Unser and Emerson Fittipaldi started in the front row. The two outdistanced their nearest rivals. Theirs was a race unto itself. Mann couldn't catch Fittipaldi, but the Indianapolis wall did. No problem for Mercedes-Benz. Unser was in second and took the lead, the checkered flag, and Indy's million dollars. But for IndyCar sanctioned races, the Mercedes-Benz isn't legal. So the Penske team uses the Ilmore racing engine. It served them well. After punting his teammate, Paul Tracy took Detroit. Fittipaldi's Ilmore powered Penske one at the Phoenix Mile. And four times, the Ilmore pushed Unser first across the finish line. Honda didn't make Indy, but is here making strides. A Honda gave Bobby Rahal a second two weeks ago. At Michigan, Ford powers the young contenders like Jacques Villeneuve, second place at Indy, the leading rookie in the series, Robbie Gordon, Toronto's pole sitter, and Michael Andretti, twice a winner this year with more visions of victory. Ford Cosworth, Gilmore, and Honda, the power battle behind the men of the Michigan 500. Michigan International Speedway and its high banks as ESPN presents live our coverage of the Marlboro 500, what can in fact be the toughest day for the Indy cars. We're located about 70 miles west of Detroit in the beautiful Irish hills of southern Michigan. These high banks can be very, very challenging for these cars and create some enormous energies. And there's a gigantic crowd here on hand to watch the Indy cars as they are ready to go to the line in the Marlboro 500. Hi, everybody. I'm Paul Page. And this race and its high banks always hold some surprises. There's always an unusual result here. And it expected to be no different here today. Now, because of that and the fact that two weeks ago at Toronto, Al Unser Jr. scored no points at all, well, the points championship, the whole national championship can be determined here. Now, this is a pivotal race. Emerson Fittipaldi, Michael Andretti closing in, as are the rest. So, in fact, at this race here today, we can see a complete change in the complexion of the PPG points battle. So as we watch this race today, you're going to see an awful lot of surprises. And in that group of drivers challenging is the pole sitter here today, Nigel Mansell. He's with Gary. And Paul, he's also the defending champion of this race. He qualified at nearly 234 miles per hour. We know of the great demands on the driver on the race car at these speeds on these banks. How tough is it physically to adapt to 500 miles, Nigel? I think on a track like this, incredibly so. I mean... Um about twice as much as probably Indianapolis because the, you know, the intensity of the lateral G you're pulling all the time on these banks. The confidence factor for you and your team today going in? Uh, as long as the car, car holds together and it runs okay, I've, I'm, I'm optimistic, but it's going to be a long way. Let's go to Jan Bikas in the middle of the front row. Well, Gary, Raul Boisel has his best starting position here at Michigan. And Raul, why is it that you always run so quickly on the big tracks? I have no idea. Maybe I think we have a good setup on the car. Uh, I enjoy very much. I have a lot of confidence to go fast, and uh, uh, we proved today. So we have a good setup in Indy. Uh, we carry through here with some changes for the bumpy track, and uh, I feel comfortable, and uh, I'm looking forward for the race. Now you've lost Mo Nunn, and he's next door to us working with Michael, but yet you out-qualified him. Yeah, Mar is very good. So uh, he put uh, Michael in front. He wasn't doing so well, and uh, we carry some of... Uh, uh, what we learn in Indy through here, and uh, Dick Simon has a good uh, uh, way to set up a car for the oval, so it's, it's, it's working well. Thank you, Raul. Let's go next door here to Gary Gerald. 
So Michael Andretti, you come in on a roll now, completing this fast front row. You won on the streets in the last race at Toronto. And we talk about this being a pivotal race in terms of the points championship. You vaulted to third with the win at Toronto. Is this the key, perhaps, of this season today for your championship hopes? It's a big key, I think, you know, because it's such a long race and it's a race of survival. And, uh, you know, not many of your fellow competitors are going to finish. So if you're lucky enough to be one of them, uh, you know, you're going to gain a lot of points on them. So uh, it's a very big race for us. Everybody agrees this is going to be some 500 miles, Paul. And there are some terrific stories on the line here for the running of the Marlboro 500 at Michigan. 250 hard, hard fought laps. We'll be right back. Today's coverage on ESPN of the Indy Cars is brought to you by Toyota, makers of the exciting all new Celica. Watch out, it's here. By Goodyear, number one in tires. And by your local Yamaha dealer who invites you to see their exciting line of motorcycles, ATVs, and snowmobiles. It's a beautiful day. It's warming up here, but the crowd has settled in for our coverage live of the Marlboro 500. Now, we've indicated, Derek Daly, what a tough track this is. It can punish both man and machine. This is officially the fastest racetrack in the world, and I'm not sure if punishment is even strong enough a word to be used for what can happen here at Michigan. When you think about racing above 230 miles an hour average for 500 miles, the forces exerted through the cars and drivers are phenomenal. Parts on the cars can fatigue and break here without any warning. And winning drivers in the past, like Michael Andretti and the defending champion Nigel Mansell, have had to have been lifted from their cars, such was the level of exhaustion. So at speeds like that, as you can imagine, the slightest miscue can spell disaster. And over the years, we have seen many, many Indy cars reduced to kit form against these very unforgiving Michigan walls. Some of these accidents have been incredibly spectacular. Perhaps the most spectacular occurred a decade ago, and it involved Chip Ganassi and Al Unser Jr. When Chip Ganassi and I got together in 84 on the back stretch coming off the two, it was the first time I had, I had lost control of my car at 200. I think we were having a bad day uh, to start with. Uh, the car was obviously a little loose, and uh, basically we had a shock problem. We were bottoming the shock a lot. I, I really don't remember much. Then when we slid down in the infield and hit the fence, then it was then it was big. Uh, I remember going down the front straightaway, and uh, the next morning I woke up at the hospital. Never forgotten it. Because of situations like that, many of the crews here fear running at the Michigan 500. When we come back, it'll be time to start the engine. Back at the Marlboro 500 is Michigan as we move closer and closer to the start of the engines. But stories developing already here today, Gary Gerald. Indeed, Paul, we've talked about the speed and the pressure and the load factors on these cars. Here's graphic evidence from the warm-up session this morning. This is a wishbone mounting front suspension left side Mark Smith's car. Look at this. This is a stress or a fatigue failure and a total collapse of this particular part. It has kept screw, uh, crews scrambling here for the last two hours trying to make a fix. Now, let me grab this bar over here and I'll give you an idea. This is not the appropriate size, but they're taking bars such as this and they're putting them on top and on bottom. Now this is down inside the cockpit on the lower left and right front sides. 
this is what the speeds of 230 miles per hour and the load factor on the car can do. It's a frightening situation. These cars have done a remarkable job, or the crews have done a remarkable job in making this repair within the last two hours. They've inventoried all of these cars. Everybody says they're now ready for the command to get ready to go racing. So, Paul, this is, this is tough, and this is what Michigan in 500 miles is all about, obviously. Well, Derek, you've raced here, you've crashed here. What can the attitude of a driver be that has to climb in a car with that repair done in the last minutes? The older you are, the more you aware you are of the possibilities and the consequences. To give you an example, Eddie Cheever only spun coming off turn two last year, and it still scares him going through turn two. So this could be a problem. All right, the crowd waits, and so do we, as we're ready for that most famous command in sports. And indeed. For the Marlboro 500, gentlemen, start your engine. He's set and ready to go as the engines fire up and down the line. All of the Indy cars ready. Nigel Mansell is set and ready to go. So the horsepower now begins to scream out its challenge from these power plants as we are ready to go racing. 250 laps lie ahead. 500 miles. The view from the rear wing of Michael Andretti. There's Raul Boisel sitting in the center of the front row. All of the cars now have started. No indication of any particular problem. You look at Robbie Gordon's car. What a great view that'll bring us here today. And Michael Andretti sits on the outside of the front row. And he begins to roll away with some special supports on the rear wings. Let's go pit side again and Jan Vikas. Well, Gary talked about what broke on the Lolo. Let's talk about what happened to the Raynard chassis. At the rear, they have a mounting block. This was on Jimmy Vassar's car. It's aluminum. It broke right across here. By the time his owner, Jim Hayhoe, could run down and warn all the other Reynard cars, Michael Andretti's broke as well. Thankfully, he was not at speed. These have been replaced by steel ones now that were produced by Jack Roush Racing in one evening. They worked all night after getting fax documents. All the Reynards now have this piece. Remember, the Reynard is an untested car here at Michigan. Let's check in now again with Gary. Another concern here, the Penske team is the only team that tests regularly here at Michigan, and we talked about the punishment on the cars. Their testing has told them that they've come up with a unique change in their rear suspension. Normally, the rear springs, identical, mounted side by side in tandem. What they've done because of the load factor on the right rear is use a spring that's actually one inch longer than the one on the left. So the right side spring is totally different on the Penske cars for this race. They're trying to ensure the fact that they can go 300 miles. They don't want that spring to be fully compressed because that magnifies the load factor on the right rear. If they can avoid that, they think they've got a better opportunity to go the 500 miles. It's a safety factor from Team Penske. The view from the front of Bobby Rahal's car as the parade laps are underway. And when we come back, we'll be ready to start the Marlboro 500 at Michigan. As the parade laps continue here at Michigan, let's take a look at the starting grid. On the pole, we'll look at the entire front row, as a matter of fact. On the pole is Nigel Mansell, his third pole of the year. Alongside Raul Boisel, who starts in the middle of the front row in both 500-mile races this year. Outside is Michael Andretti, only the second front row start this year for the two-time Michigan champion. In row two, it's Robbie Gordon, the Toronto Bull sitter. Mario Andretti, the 84 Michigan 500 winner. And Stefan Johansson in the fastest Penske chassis in today's field. Row three is Emerson Fittipaldi. His first win ever came here in 85. Teo Bobby, the 83 Bull sitter. And Dominic Dobson, the fastest rookie qualifier in this field. In row four, Jacques Villeneuve. Paul Tracy is in the middle. And to the outside is Scott Goodyear. In row five, Adrian Fernandez. Al Unser Jr. with a surprising qualification run, and Marco Greco. Row six, Mauricio Guzmi, Jimmy Vassar, and Scott Sharp. In row number seven, Eddie Cheever replacing Brian Herta in A.J. Foyt's car. Hiro Mashushka and Buddy Lazier. The eighth row, Mike Groff, Willie T. Riffs, and Bobby Rahal. The ninth row, Mark Smith, Ari Lyon Dyke, and Ross Bentley. And alone in the tenth and final row is Jeff Wood. So now with a single PPG car in front of them, Jim Swindoll trying to get all the field to close up on the pace car. 
We're set to go on the pace lap now. The field aligned in rows of three for the first time since 1989. 250 laps, 500 miles. The fastest race ever run here by Ellinger Jr. at 189.7 miles an hour. One car having a problem early on, ducked in and out of the pits. Did you see why he went in, Derek? I didn't. Buddy Lazier in the financial world car. Quick stop, but everything looks to be in order. But he was at the back of the grid anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. How nice they look in order. The former winners here in this race. Michael Andretti, of course, with two victories. The defending champion is Nigel Mansell and Scott Goodyear. His first and only victory coming here. Now they begin to align. There are your rows as they sweep off the final turn and look for a green flag. We're underway. The Marlboro 500 is underway as Nigel Mansell holds his position at the front. Boisel challenges to the high side. They're three abreast through the first and second turn. Look at Michael. He sweeps around roll. Boisel ducks in the second place. Down the back stretch. Michael chases Nigel. Roll Boisel closes in. First, second, and third run together. Mario Andretti slides into fourth place. Through the high banks of three and four, Michael Andretti chases Nigel Mansell. And they scream across the line with Nigel Mansell leading the first lap and Mario Andretti making a move to the inside of Boisel. So Mario moves to the inside, comes around Boisel. Now he's forced back up high. He had third for a moment, but Boisel takes it back. And there is a certain prestige to leading laps here at the Michigan 500. Manson led, but Michael, who's a master of the outside pass, got a poor start off the line. But boy, he made a very pass around the outside. There are three racing grooves here that you can use at Michigan. Mario and Freddie here in fourth place. He's been sweeping up and down on the track. Looking for a groove that's going to work early as we watch Robbie Gordon. Watching Robbie Gordon, somebody who got a tremendous start from that second row, tried to come down the inside of Mansell, but Gordon knows he needs to settle down because he is extremely consistent so far this year. He wants to add another 500 miles. Christian Fittipaldi back in six, 219 miles an hour for the first lap. There's fifth place, Robbie Gordon. He's chasing Mario Andretti. And there's our leader, Nigel Mansell. over. It was so brutal to Nigel that they literally had to lift him out of his race car at the end of the run. Michael Andretti on board. Matter of fact, when he won here, the same thing. He was totally exhausted. He could barely conduct any interviews. And there's the bumpy section of turn four that the drivers have complained about. Quick look there as we back to Teo Fabi in a battle with the Raynard of Adrian Fernandez. Teo Fabi on the move as he just moved into 11th place coming around. Adrian Fernandez, Al Enzer Jr. is sitting back there as well and looking for his move to come up to the front of the field. Now to the front of the field. This is the fight between Raul Boisel on the left and Mario Andretti on the right. They're fighting it out for third place as Mario seems to have found the line that he likes. Absolutely furious during official practice here. Mario could not get his pop-off valve to seat properly. Could not get the power horsepower he thought he deserved from that Ford engine and was furious. I didn't think he had a fair run with the handling of his car in, in qualifying. But he is running well in the opening laps here. All day today, this will be a comparison of the power plant. As you want Raul Boisel, Robbie Gordon moves to the high side. Right past Mario Andretti. Brave move by Robbie Gordon. He has practiced that here all weekend. He said, my favorite groove is high on the racetrack. My car feels good there. And look, he pulls out seven car lengths just coming off one corner. We're now on board with Flash Gordon, Robbie Gordon. Robbie Gordon very definitely on a charge. He runs down the back stretch, setting up Raul Boisel just ahead. He just had a little look at the left side mirror there to see where Mario was. Here's the new surface. Now it comes to the old surface. Let it drift high all the way to the wall on the outside. John Mikas, Robbie Gordon is really on a charge. Well, keep in mind, Paul, that they made a commitment that they were going to work on this car here this weekend in race trim only. The only change that Robbie Gordon has made the whole time he's been here is to change.
changed the ride height by eight one thousandths of an inch. They did not go for qualifying. This car can run as fast in qualifying, in the race, I should say, as it did in qualifying. Well, he darted to the inside. They're looking to take advantage of the slower cars. The field already overcoming some of the slower cars in the field, but it was not to be. In fact, it put Robbie back a little bit in his continuing battle for third with Raul Boisel. Maintaining momentum is a big key, key here through the banks and down these long back straights. Gordon had a charge and a run on Bozell. Now he hangs back. This is where he passed Mario. Obviously, this car is very good in the first three. Already eight laps into the record book. They're averaging 222.8 miles an hour. Nigel Mansell has a four-second lead over second place. Michael Andretti bears third place. Raul Boisel and Robbie Gordon continues to try and pursue there, while Mario is set up about 100 yards back from Robbie Gordon. Then Emerson Fittipaldi, then Paul Tracy. So the two Penskys have climbed their way up through the field. Stefan Johansson is eighth. Ninth is Scott Goodyear, and Jacques Villeneuve is in tenth. on Boisell from Gary Terrell. First radio conversation to the crew, Paul, indicates that Raul Boisell running third has begun to pick up a bit of a push and is now being pressured by Robbie Gordon. You saw him dart down to the inside going into three. Now you're on board the nose of Bobby Rahal, who very early here on lap number 10 is making an unscheduled stop in the pits. Could it be more trouble for the Honda engine? They've had lots of trouble with the Honda here this weekend. For some reason, it does not like running in the high bank. They blew three engines before qualifying ever started on Saturday afternoon. Continue to watch this battle for third place. Still tries to close in, and back marker traffic very much a factor now. What a spectacular view! That's mounted on the left side pod, just ahead of the left rear wheel on Rami Gordon's. Check with Carl Hogan as the crew had peeled off the rear bodywork and we're looking around the power plant and it is a power problem. Carl said that the uh, car just stopped on him. That was the only word they had from the radio. Ray Hall just shakes his head in frustration as he comes now over the pit wall. Oh, what a terrible disappointment. Not that, that must be two weeks ago. The Honda performing so well for him and Toronto gave him a podium finish. Carl Hogan there, co owner with Bobby Ray Hall. Back to the front of the field now. Nigel Mansell is the leader. He's now pulled out five and a half seconds over second place Michael Andretti and begins to handle up some traffic as he comes alongside Scott Sharp. So Nigel Mansell looking very much like last year where he led 222 laps. Will he do it again? We'll be right back. Back at the Marlboro 500, there are the intervals in the top six drivers in the field, and you can see that Paul Tracy is gotten around Emerson Fittipaldi and into sixth place. But perhaps most important is the fact that Robbie Gordon has finally resolved that battle with Raul Boisel and is solidly in third place now as you ride with Robbie Gordon. There's Mario Andretti closing on Raul Boisel. This is a battle for fourth. Boisel, the, the pass was, was really almost a non-pass. It was almost like Boisel slowed down a little bit when Robbie Gordon went by. Let's watch this one. Mario has been taking this high line all to the race over. Look at the sandwich job here. But Mario almost makes a pass goes out. Not quite. Let me assure you, that takes courage. They're averaging 221.4 miles an hour. You can see Mario and Bozell are in two different racing grooves. Mario is high, which is the long way around. But you can keep your 
foot down sometimes when the car begins to skate, and it does skate sometimes over these bumps. Derek, as, as they encounter these slower cars, is turbulence a key factor for both of them? Turbulence is only a key if the traffic gets in your way. Most cars we've seen so far in the center groove can stay there. That's what the leading cars want them to do. You never change your line to allow a quicker car to pass on a super speedway because you take the faster driver by surprise. Well, so far now with 19 laps complete, the battles have all involved the number five car of Raul Boisel, now being chased by Mario Andretti. You can see the comparison of their speed on the last lap. Raul has had a third, a fourth, and a fifth place here. First today, perhaps. Nothing for Bobby Rahal, Gary Darrell. Bobby, was there any warning whatsoever? No, the engine just uh, just quit on me going on the back straight. Uh, I don't know what. I mean, everything was running normally at the time, and uh, it must be like a fuel pump or something, I guess. So it, they tried to start it in here, but it wouldn't start, so uh, I don't know what went wrong with it. Big week coming up because I know now you're supposed to test Tuesday and Wednesday in Mid-Ohio with a new Honda power plant, a new version. Well, we, we had a little disappointment this weekend. Uh, aside from this, uh, that engine now is very late, so we're going to have to make do with what we've got. But, um, yeah, it's really too bad because Miller and Motorola, all of our spots have been very patient. We, uh, we think we can have a good car in Mid-Ohio, so I think we can be more competitive. But the Ovals definitely have not been our friends with this engine this year. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Bad for Bobby Rahal, as now you're on board with race leader Nigel Mansell. Get that left side camera. If you compare, as you watch these onboard shots, consider the clouds are running level. That'll give you a real good idea of how much they really roll into the bank as they come into the corner. We look at the running order and the completion of the 21st lap. And 18 degrees does not sound a lot. If you try to walk up that bank, you would be astonished how hard a job it is to walk up to the concrete wall. This gives you an idea how bumpy this racetrack can be because it shocks. Oh, oh tire blow. Gordon's in trouble. He holds it off the wall thus far. Oh, what a scary moment for Gordon. Look at that the thing peeling off. Yellow flag, of course, comes out. Still a very dangerous moment for the driver that was running so well in third place. Two weeks ago at Toronto, very much the same thing. He was the pole sitter, had tire problems, ran off the end of the court. And that may be the scariest moment that Robbie Gordon has ever had on a super speedway. Remember, when the car was running well, you never go below 225 miles an hour, then you have a tire blow. 23rd lap, the leader, Nigel Mansell, is into the pits. I would say this would be a little early, so an interesting strategy being played by the Newman Haas team, at least with Nigel Mansell. The stop itself is routine, though we saw some work from this onboard camera occurring at the back of the car. I'm really sure what that is. Look at him skate as he comes out, 11.5 seconds. Nigel Mansell is out. Minipoli is in as well. So a lot of cars deciding lap 23-24 is a good position, Gary Terrell. Yeah, Paul, it's interesting, too. The Penske cars are in for service to leave we're watching Fittipaldi go out Tracy missed his pit that's one of the dangers of this super speedway you run 220 out there you've got a 110 limit in here he was too fast and he missed his pit had to go around again well Hunter Jr. Emerson Fittipaldi you saw Scott Sharp Michael Andretti still out on the circuit and we saw an adjustment in the front wings of Emerson's car they turned the screws down which takes away front down for so Emerson was obviously not happy with the handling during that front run but you must try and take advantage of yellow flag conditions in these 500-mile races because it can be a huge advantage. So we are under yellow for the first time here today. The question will be, when the tire went, to do any other damage to Robbie Gordon's car? He did drive it back to the pit. Back at the Marlboro 500, still under yellow, but here's a surprise. Nigel Mansell into the pits for a second time. They go to work on the front of the car. Down under 
well beyond the suspension members with regard to the shock absorbers and everything. What is all the way down there? It, Robbie Gordon's car also in the pits. Apparently there is some damage there that they're going to have to work with. Jan Vikas? Well, I can update on both of those, Paul. First of all, Nigel Mansell just radioed in and said, if this car, if we can't fix it, I can't drive it. They're trying to work in the shock absorber area. With Robbie Gordon, he's been in the pits once. They replaced the tire that blew. Right now, they're beating with a hammer the front steering rod. It was bent. That means the toe out was off on the car. Robbie Gordon now pulling away, and Gary has more. Gary? The report we get, Jan, is that it was a stuck throttle, and I can't imagine anything other than fire that would be a bigger nightmare for a race driver. Mansell is now engaged the clutches, rolled away. He'll go back out to try it again. Well, that confirms something. I thought that they were well forward to the shock absorber. It's a stuck throttle, my goodness. Now, let's take a look at Robbie Gordon's situation. That's what set up this yellow flag here, the second one of the day. Look at Gordon's right front tire. Just suddenly, bam, and look at him. Look at him. Remember, this is along the front straight here. There was only a gentle curve. If that had happened, what's the explosion? Bang, right there, explodes and takes the cap almost all the way off that tire. That was a one-way trip to the concrete wall for Robbie Gordon if he was in turns one or three. Watch that right front. And when it lets go, he very gently keeps the car on line. You can't touch the brakes or anything at that point. Yeah, you have to use finesse. Right as he goes by our boot, just watch. And what it has managed to do is cause some damage to that steering arm in the front. You can see it bent there, Jan Vikas. Well, what we're trying to take a look at here is the tire that actually blew. You can see it blew to smithereens, and obviously they're trying to get that tire away as quickly as possible because they want to get it back to Goodyear. There's a couple reasons why they want to take that away. Obviously, it's not great advertising, but also these tires are very secret. They check every tire in and every tire out because they're obviously anticipating Firestone coming here. Gary has more up on pit lane. Gary? And Nigel Mansell had come back in after one lap. He goes back out. What they've done is to try to get to the throttle cable in a couple of different areas, or the linkage, we should say. And they got it engaged, and then they sprayed it with a lubricant, trying to make sure that it functions properly. Mansell back out now. We'll get his next test as he uh, goes toward turns one and two. In the meantime, the Walker racing team is going to work on that right front steering link on Robbie Gordon's car. Apparently, they was bent too much, and they're changing it now. Thankfully, they elected to change that because with the fatigue levels that you have here, that was already bent and stressed and strained, so a new one is so much better. The Goodyear blimp spirit of Akron is floating overhead, providing aerial views of the Marlboro 500. The Goodyear blimp has been flying over major events for 61 years. We are under yellow here on the 28th lap. The yellow came out when Robbie Gordon had his problem with that blowing tire. They're checking the course totally for debris. And Michael Andretti, after the stops, picks up the lead. Back at the Marlboro 500 at Michigan International, as the PPG pace car leads the field around, they begin to pick up the speed. Derek, what could have happened to that tire? The third car, by the way, here is the leader, Michael Andretti, when they come back to green. We have had an unusual number of punctures this weekend, and I went over to Goodyear yesterday, and most of them are caused by debris on the racetrack. Bozell comes down the inside, has a little look at Michael, but most of the tire cuts are caused by the cars picking up debris on the racetrack. Believe it or not, the sweeper was at one time, it dropped one of its bristles, it's punctured a tire, so the sweeper also had a big but we are in a fight right here with Bozell and Michael. Oh, Bozell charges on Michael Andretti. Mario Andretti runs in third. Emerson Fittipaldi and Al Unger Jr. are up running fourth and fifth now. But here is the fight, and it's for the lead. Two distinctly different lines here, two different chassis. Michael, another driver who likes that high line during qualifying, although he wasn't on the pole, he was absolutely flat out all the way around. He said what he liked about this car most of all was his handling on four tanks in race conditions, and Tracy is in the pit lane. Paul Tracy, remember he overran his pit earlier. He's back in the pit lane again. He has not been handling well with running in position. 
when he headed down to the pits. Michael Andretti, the only two time winner here, is the Penske team working on Paul Tracy's car. And again, it's something in the front end. They're a little higher up working in that shock absorber area. You stress and you strain everything so much on these race cars. Millions of dollars going into the preparation. And something small, which is probably what happened to Tracy, suddenly calls an end to your day. Now, well, another example of that. Mike Cross has had a clutch problem. He is out of the race. Both of the Ray Hall Hogan cars, both of the Honda power plants, are out of the race. Back straight, almost 240 miles an hour and flat into three. Update on Paul Tracy's problem, Gary Farrell. Paul, he's complaining of a problem that the car doesn't feel right at the front, and the reason being he hit a wheel when he came in on one of those pit attempts. I'm not sure it was the one where he missed, which may have been a reason he missed, or if it was the later routine stop, but he did strike a wheel, and he says the front end just doesn't feel right. He's not comfortable at speed out here. The crew is checking. They're shaking their head. I don't think they found a specific problem thus far. Now they're calling for a, a full four-tire wheel change. Battle for fifth. Emerson Fittipaldi, Adrian Fernandez closing. This young driver, Fernandez, is looking very strong. How would you like to take on somebody like Fittipaldi? The first track that he's won on, and you're new to this surface. And look at this, look at this. In the draft order, Emerson slingshots by. They both have the D engine, phase three, but Fernandez blows by the Penske. I'll tell you what, he almost misjudged that. That was real close when he started out. He got the toe off of Fittipaldi's car and down the back stretch, looking very solid. And Fernandez into the plate. Great run for Fernandez. Very big name in Mexico, but Manso is still in deep trouble. And Jan Beek is up there. Well, the one thing I can tell you, Derek, is that they had him shut down the engine. That means they're going to make a big change here. You can see Tom works trying to get down inside there to get to the throttle area like Gary was telling us about. They're also going to take off the engine cover because they have to look at this cable both on the front and the rear. We don't know if it's a linkage, we don't know if it's cable, but right now this crew has both ends covered. I don't think I'd like to try any place with the throttle sticking. Here it might be an advantage though, just lock it down and hold on. Pit stops might be a little difficult. Exactly, it scares you too much. Of winning two in a row, or now it becomes a long, laborious day for him. Because remember, he does not like this racetrack, particularly turn four. In fact, Friday, he walked away from his car, not won it in the last session. And this morning, he only ran a short number left. Well, card, Justin Neb now behind Fittipaldi. Scott Goodyear lined up behind him, and now running in seventh position. Rookie with such a great job at the Indianapolis 500. Rookie of the Year there leads in the points for the IndyCar Rookie of the Year. And he closes on Fittipaldi. Now, is that an indication of some strategy on Fittipaldi's part? Second guy that we've seen be able to close in? Uh, it might be an indication as we watch a quick glimpse of Scott Goodyear. It might be an indication that Emerson, the changes he made in the last pit stop, he doesn't like them as we go back to our battle for second place. Again, it's Mario and Bozell. Currently in second, Mario third. Boisel has been in the thick of the fight the entire day. Gracie just ahead there, taking his car down. He sees the faster car is coming. But he tends to stay with him, so maybe his problem has been repaired. Update on Nigel Manselyan. Well, the Cosworth engineers have found the problem with the Ford power plant. It turns out they took the pop-off valve off and it went down inside the engine. And there's actually a butterfly inside the engine that's stuck. They're trying to spray some fluid in there and actually use the wood part of a hammer to try and close it. Oh, right now they get the signal. Nigel's day is over. They cannot fix it here. So powerful here a year ago. Made his strong charge in the 28th lap on to the finish. A key ingredient in his championship and his first and only 500 win. But Nigel Mansell, the defending IndyCar champion, climbs out of his car and sits down. I think just thankful that he's got all of his parts with him. 
Nigel Mansell, an early retiree. He's with Jan Vikas. Nigel, that was a very scary moment for you. The throttle stuck open, did it? Uh, that's the scare, scariest moment I've had in my whole career. I mean, we're doing 240 in the slipstream going down into one, and the throttle just started, stuck wide open. And I had to jam the brakes on and dip the clutch and try and get around the corner. And I was trying to do that for a few laps, but there's no way. And uh, the boys have done a fantastic job all weekend, and Newman has teams run real well. And as you can see, we're in the lead, and the car was running fantastic. And just one lap, and it just stuck open like a switch. Nigel, tell us, try to describe for us how tough it is physically out there for you. Well, it's, it's bad enough. You're pulling a lot of lateral G. You're, you're averaging 227 on four tanks. And you know, you need the throttle control in the corners to balance the car. And when it sticks wide open, and you know, you gotta try and get around the corner. I tell you, it's not nice. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Back on board, Robbie Gordon now. Remember, he had his problem. He's trying to carve his way up through the field, but he has a long drive ahead. Still, he's running at speed with the leaders, so it gives us a good idea from the Ford Electronics of exactly what the performance of this car is. Watch the speed climb. 231, 3. Just, just off the front of the balance a little bit. That's what Mansell couldn't do. So he was on a direction towards the concrete wall when he got that scare. But Mansell mentioned G-forces, lateral Gs. They pull almost four Gs lateral, that sideways Gs. But the banking creates almost 20, now 20 vertical Gs downwards, such as the force. What does that mean? Well, it means 20 times the weight of the car, which is 1,500 pounds, is acting downwards. That is the type of load the driver must absorb here for 500 miles. Robbie Gordon is running in 14th, a lap behind the leader as Raul Boisel has to work his way through traffic with Mario Andretti still very much in pursuit. Mario the master, final races, so many times, so many years he's been in and hasn't won many, but he knows to stay in touch. If you have to get 450 miles safe under your belt, before you really think about a sprint, and he changes his line and comes way down low under Dominic Dobson and then tries to make a swoop on Fabi. A lot of traffic ahead, Dobson, Fabi jumps ahead of him, he comes down low, he really has to judge now. Jimmy Vassar, the Conseco car, is in the pits. This would be unscheduled as well. Started off the season very strong. Look at the back end. Nothing wrong there. Gearbox engine. Something smoky. Vassar is one of those drivers who experienced that rear suspension failure on the Raynard, and it did give him a bit of a jolt, which took him a few laps to get back up to speed from. But he was running in a good 10th place, but obviously it's all come to naught for Vassar. With the yellow, our average speed of the race has dropped off to 183.1 miles an hour. As Jimmy Vassar looks at the mount that could carry him no further than the 50th lap. The leader, Michael Andretti, now working lap 51. But look at the heat pouring off those brakes. Serious overheat. He can't speculate what that could be. Brakes binding. Outside drive shaft gone too dry, which obviously can only break. Don't stop or get forced to make a stop. Mario Andretti back working his high line temporarily out of contact in his battle with Raul Boisel. That's Marco Perco sitting just ahead of him. And he's got Marco sitting there. He's got to figure out with these slower cars where is the best place to pass both in terms of high or low. But how do I pace myself into the pass? And again, you have to have confidence that the driver you're passing sees you. Now, Greco has taken the low line. Mario followed him for all that they still up and then moved to the high line. The veterans will tell the new guys, never, ever change your line. Let us do the work. Let us make the pass. And there's what Mario lost to Raul Boisel in having to handle up those slower cars. It's not necessarily logical that Raul Boisel got through them in the same time. He may have encountered them at an entirely different part of the race course. Let's go to the pits, Gary Carroll. Paul, it's interesting. We talked about that problem that many of the chassis had with the strengthening of the wishbone mounting at the start of the show. 
one of the offshoots of that change with the extra support in there, it does slightly impact the handling of the car. Dick Simon says that's why Bosell picked up the push. They made one change on his pit stop. The car is better, but it's still pushing. He says with our second stop, we think we can get it perfect, and they look for Raul to then mount a bigger charge. Watching Al Unser Jr. now, he runs in fourth place and is beginning to whittle away on third place Mario Andretti. Al Unser Jr. had this crowd on its feet yesterday. He was spectacular. The high Rock race managed to beat everybody. Didn't win the championship, but now he lines up to do exactly what we saw Mario do. Pulls out the pass. Michael Gregor, who also is having one of his better runs this afternoon. Pacing a little bit better here for a little while. He came up and counted the Just actually passed him. While Mario had to wait a little bit. And the feeling is that these Pepsi cars do not have the ultimate speed to be alone in a straight fight on a radar. Unser Jr. is in championship winning mode. He wants reliability and just keep handing out these laps, lap after lap. Here was closing on Mario. Couple of laps, despite the fact that he had a clean pass on Greco, he's actually fallen back about seven in a second. So Hunter Jr. still has some work to do. Let's go pit side Jan again. Well, Jimmy Vassar has gotten out of the car, and Jimmy, you ran to the top ten. We saw that smoke. We'll put you out. Well, we thought we uh, had a, a tire going down right rear. I, I was out there and started getting a little loose, like I wanted to swap ends, and uh, so we came in for a tire change, and uh, turns out it was something in suspension. Uh, probably a wheel bearing or something. So that was two scary moments for you here this weekend. Well, that's racing, you know. You just got to get back in there and uh, you got to you got to trust your car. But when things happen like that, you know, it, it makes you take a deep breath and you know and just uh, thank the Lord that uh, you don't hit the fence because it's pretty fast around here. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank you. While we were listening to Jimmy Master, the fastest lap in the race has been set. Michael Andretti at 227.8 miles an hour. As we watch Jack Villeneuve as he continues to fly up through this field and sits now in fifth. Now don't underestimate what Jimmy Vassar said. He takes a deep breath and thanks the Lord that he made it. That gives you an idea just how knife edge and finger tingling it is to run on the ragged edge here at these speeds. Of this. 58 laps complete by the leader, Michael Andretti. He has a nine second lead over second place, Raul Boisel. Mario Andretti in his last 500 mile race is still very much in the fight. Well, some historic moments coming at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Brickyard pole qualifying at Indy will witness more than 82 entrants at the first ever NASCAR Brickyard 400. ESPN's Bob Jenkins, Ned Jarrett, and Benny Parsons will be hosting qualifying Thursday and Friday live beginning at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We're at the Marlboro 500 in Michigan. You ride with the leader, Michael Andretti, as he reels off lap after lap at better than 228 miles an hour. He has a 13-second lead over second place Raul Boisel. The early leader was Nigel Mansell, who had a problem with his throttle system, actually a butterfly in the engine that stuck the engine wide open at top revs and took him out of the race. Robbie Gordon was up in the fight. He had a right front tire blow. He got it back to the pits. They changed the tire, did some work on the car, and he is back in the race, though not yet in the fight. Right now, it's Raul Boisel, who is battling all day, sitting in second place, and Mario Andretti is having a great day running in third. And great pictures here as we look over Michael Andretti's shoulder. Look at his hand. Pushes with his right and pulls down with his left. How fast is Michael running? He just set fast lap of the race at 228.4, which is almost three miles an hour quicker than Bozell and Mario is running at this particular time. So Michael in control with sheer speed. Pit stops do any time now. The Gallus team for Adrian Fernandez is uh, already begun to lay out their equipment as there's Richard Buck, the crew chief for Al Unser Jr. And little Al is in from fourth place, Gary Gerald. Indeed he is. The man has had such a sensational season. Has won one time here at Michigan in 500-mile competition. 
getting the full treatment. The car's been working beautifully. No changes, just full fuel and fresh rubber. Now he's rolling, Paul, 13.5 seconds. Emphasis on the word fresh rubber. Those look like brand new tires. They were indeed brand new tires as Mario comes down. Third place, Mario Andretti. He's been battling most of the day with Raul Boisel. He rolls into the pits and then rolls past. And look, with Fernandez in trouble. He came out, he had a fuel spill, a splash, and a bit of a fire. Fernandez, who was running so well, it's high as fifth place. They got a lot of water on him right away. Now, water will dilute the alcohol fuel, but there's still more trouble burning in there. Let's not forget that they had a full pit fire here in the early years. We're under yellow on the course. And Michael Andretti against the wall. Michael Andretti grabs the wall. So in just a few seconds, we told you there's surprises that lurk in these high banks. Look at the camera. It's now pointed down and to the side on Michael Andretti's car. So Adrian Fernandez with a fire on his car in the pits. They go yellow, though, for Michael Andretti, who catches the wall. And Michael Andretti's crew was sitting there waiting for him. Michael climbs over the wall, apparently unhurt, hopefully so. There's a safety crew right there. And some of the crew members from the Gallus team, when the fuel splashed, let's see what happened, Derek. There's Michael. He's in a traffic jam. This is turn one. He goes into one. All is clear. Remember the fastest car of the race track. He gets up behind and then something. That was most unusual. We saw like he was up behind Paul Tracy and, and just suddenly bobbled. Could it be the turbulence back there? I don't think it would happen that fast. Whatever it was, the fastest man in the race in Look, total control. And all you can see here what happened. Car, the hose just ripped off at the nozzle. Well, we don't know if that happened before or after. Mario Andretti's in the pits. Look at all the water from the Fernandez situation. We've seen Mario do a 180, trying to exit the pits in the past on dry pavement. Now you better take it real slowly. I think he went to the truck. Almost too slowly. Well, under yellow, no need to hurry. You might as well be careful. Downing and Adrian Fernandez's pit, Gary Gerald. Gallus, unfortunately, you're no stranger. I remember Cleveland a few years ago and your crew went through this. Can you give us a quick assessment here? Have you accounted for everybody? Are we all right? Yeah, we're okay, I think, Gary. So that's the main thing. We're okay. And uh, the fire people did a really good job. And I'm real happy and I, I appreciate what they did to take care of my guys. And I don't know exactly what happened, but fortunately, no one got hurt. Now, we see the nozzle was sticking out of the side of the fuel cell there of the car. Did, did everything just disengage? Do you have any idea? No, no, I, we pulled out too early, and uh, I don't know really what happened, why we did it, but we weren't through fueling. Well, the important thing, obviously, we're, we're happy to hear everybody's okay. Yeah, Thanks. I just, right. just want to th thank the fire people. Absolutely. They did an incredible job, Paul. I mean, you, it was amazing. The fire crews have always been courageous here. Here is Michael Andretti's situation, Derek. Now we know he's in traffic. That's Paul Tracy down to the inside. Going into one. Well, well, well. We can see. I think he locks that right front and just destroys our onboard camera. Thankfully, Michael wasn't hurt, but. The fastest car in the racetrack now gets grabbed by the monster behind these concrete walls. Looked like the closure just was too fast. Michael Andretti brushed the brakes, took him up to the wall. Eddie Cheever replacing Brian Herta, driving for A.J. Foyt, has rolled to a stop. We are still under yellow, though, from Michael Andretti's accident. And Raul Boisel is the leader of the race under yellow. Of course, one of the key differences between Formula One refueling and the use, their use of their gasoline and IndyCar refueling is they are pressurized in Formula One. This is gravity flow feed of methanol fuel in IndyCar racing. The methanol fuel has a much higher flash point, though obviously it can catch fire. Its downside is that it's sometimes very difficult to see where the fire is actually burning. But perhaps the best information is that you can do that. You can throw water on it, it dilutes methanol and puts the fire out. But you see the problem there. One of the crew members had to say, hey, this guy's on fire, even though you can't see the flames. The 
international accepted IndyCar way of saying I'm on fire is to pat your chest with your hands. I'm not sure if Fernandez has ever seen that or certainly ever had to do it before. But one of the real fears, look at the signage on the pit wall just melted. One of the real fears for a driver is fire and mechanical failure. We have seen both with Mansell and now the fire with Fernandez. Gary Gerald, do you have an update on Fernandez's mm -hmm. fire? Yeah, in a follow-up, Paul, checking with Rick Gallus and the other members of the team, the safety crew took Adrian Fernandez, the driver, who told me personally that he was fine, no problem, in for a routine check. And the fueler, Wayne Selman, also was complaining of some minor discomfort around his hip and they were going to take him in and check on him. So one crew member, Selman the Fueler, not believed to be any type of a serious injury to the safety center. Let's go to Jan. Well, Gary, talking about fuel, Eddie Sheever ran out of fuel. That's why we saw him stop. He's now back in the pits. They tried to fire it, and when they went to fire it, they realized they had a battery problem. So now they have changed the battery, which, of course, fires the electronics in these things. Soon, Eddie Sheever hopefully will be underway in the Copenhagen A.J. Foyt entry. Pulling a lot of black boxes off the right side pot of that car for A.J. Foyt, who, by the way, is going to try and qualify for the Brickyard this week. He'll see coverage here on ESPN. We'll be back with more of the Marlboro 500. Today's coverage from Michigan International Racing's fastest track is brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. Eddie Cheever's car being pushed back toward the garage area. Apparently that's not going to be a fix on that car. On board Robbie Gordon who is still a lap down from the leader of the race Raul Boisel. But how about this for a top of the order. Boisel, Villeneuve, Al Hunter Jr. First, second and third. Mario Andretti is fourth. Emerson Fittipaldi is fifth. Penske cars with a less than spectacular qualifying situation here. But two of them are up and running in the top five. But is it the first win for Raul Boisel today? Imagine he hopes so. 74 laps of the 250 lap scheduled distance complete. Race average with two yellows, 170 miles an hour. As we go back to green. Boisel down in that order. And there he is down on the low side. Villeneuve comes up high trying to come around one of the Pac West cars. Glimpse at the restart of Robbie Gordon, who's all the way down. He has to make a third lap before he thinks about getting another lap back. On goes down to get back in the fight. Young John Bill knew very much in pursuit now, trying to car traffic. As Boisel closes on tail Bobby. He's got Goodyear in there as well. Dominic Dobson, but Jack makes his move to the high side. And it was a decisive move. Johansson, who had had qualified all the factory Penske's run very well in qualifying, not on the pace here. Milnum was superb in Friday. Oh, he's in the wall! Oh, no! You know, not dissimilar, though, different placement of the cars from the accident involving Michael Andretti. He'd just come around seventh place, Stefan Johansson. Skates up to the wall and grabs it. He had such a great run at the Indianapolis 500. Rookie of the year there. Leading to rookie points. He's cut off the whole right-hand side of the car. He appears to be okay. He's moving around in the cockpit. So that's good news. Once again, the engineering of the cars has really protected the driver here. And now, Robbie Gordon, one of our early pace setters in particular. If Bozell is picked up by the pace car, Gordon goes all the way around and makes up most of the lap, but he needs one more. It also allows Mario, Al Jr., Emerson, and Goodyear to catch up behind those leaders. We can see this coming. He turns to the three. And out of the groove. And smacks and destroys the right side of the car, but hopefully he is okay. He is uh, traveling at that time across that 780 feet of new asphalt that Penske Speedway is laid down there. Safety crew is keeping Jack in the car. And I assume that this is just precautionary because he was moving around fine at first, but no, they've got the cutting tools on the right side. He may be pinned in that car, the right front wheel, very often, and that side impact comes in through the monocoque and traps the driver. 
puts you in mind almost of Brian Herta's accident in Toronto. Watch him go into turn three. And as he goes onto the new surface, there is a puff of something comes from the right side of Villeneuve's car. Watch what happens right here. Here's the surface change. Oh. Bottom. Oh, I think he got a puncture. I think he had a puncture. He certainly had a mechanical failure of some sort that sent Jacques Villeneuve very, very hard into that outside wall. No question at the right rear set down. Here's another angle of it. Watch the right rear. Very clear, very clear in that shot. Something broke, something broke in the right rear of that car. The top hits the ground, sits down, and Villeneuve, unfortunately, has no control and just clouts that outside wall so hard when you're running at the speeds of IndyCar officials are saying that he has non-threatening injuries. I don't see any injuries at all, so that's good news is Dr. Terry Trammell Look at him. He gives a wave to the crowd. Dr. Trammell walks him away. Let's go to Jerry Gerald. Well, here's some more good news. Michael Andretti, after a quick stop at the uh, infield uh, hospital, okay. Can you tell us now what happened? Because it looked like you had everybody covered today, Mike. Yeah, we were really hooked up, and we made a change after the first pit stop, and after that, we were just uh, gone. You know, I picked up about five miles an hour. And, uh, uh, it just was coming up on, I think it was Emerson and uh, Robbie Gordon, and they were in a battle, and and I guess Robbie, it looked like Robbie went up in front of Emerson and made Emerson get on the brakes, and I had a head of steam coming behind him, and I locked up my front to miss him and put me up into the gray, and then I was up in the marbles, and I couldn't turn, and it just hit the wall. Another two feet wider, and I probably would have been made it. So many times we talk about the emotions of the up and down, the elation of the last race in Toronto, back in the championship points hunt, and here you are now, and in great disappointment, but you're not alone. A lot of people having problems here. Yeah, they are, but you see the Penske's are running pretty good, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. And with that little gleam in his eye, oh boy, it tells a lot. Let's go to Jan. Well, Gary, in the Jacques Villeneuve incident, we need to look at why he was able to get out of that car without necessarily the same kind of work as with Alola. As this front suspension gets pushed back into the car itself, there's something different in the Reynard than you have in Alola. If we go inside the cockpit, we have an opportunity to see on their gear shift, they use an actual cable instead of linkage. This is what's been hurting the drivers and breaking legs and pelvises here recently because the Lola has a actual metal linkage as opposed to a flexible cable. That really helped in the case of Jacques Villeneuve. By the way, speaking of injuries, a couple of updates as they still pick up debris here. Here are the cars that are out of race thus far. Some fairly major names, the early leader, Mansell, the fire on Fernandez's car, both of the Ray Hall Hogan's car. Fernandez and their crew member have both been treated and released right here at the track medical facility. And most recently, Michael Andretti, a leader of the race at the time, and Jacques Villeneuve. And let's just update on Brian Herta, who is out of the hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana, and, uh, and going through therapy there. Alessandro Zampedri was involved in a practice accident here, possible fracture to his pelvis and a bruised liver. That's why he's not in the run here in Michigan. Sunday night baseball on ESPN. The Oakland A's, led by power hitter Ruben Sierra, traveled to Detroit to meet with home run hitter Cecil Fielder with 25 this season. Sunday night baseball from Tiger Stadium tonight at 8 o'clock Eastern. Under yellow at the Marlboro 500 at Michigan is our third of the day. This time it's Jack Villeneuve. He's with Gary Gerald. Getting ready to go into the medical center for a checkup. You appear to be okay, Jack. Can you tell us about how this set up and what happened? Yeah, uh, getting into the corner. I don't know if it's the rear that collapsed or something went under the car, but the left front of the car went up in the air and just went straight in the wall, so I don't really know what happened. Uh, but the monocoque came on me, and uh, I was stuck. Uh, my hand was stuck in between the monocoque and the steering, and uh, my suit was in, inside the carbon, and so I took all the impact with the shoulder and everything. Did you see the wheel that came back over your head? No, I didn't see that. I don't know. I don't really know what happened exactly. I just know the, the front left went up in the air. 
now yesterday you had a problem with the wheel bearing that went out on the car and also there was the problem of the fix from friday involving the rear suspension are, are you concerned that it could have been some type of structural failure i don't think it was that because if it was something like that i would have uh, made a spin and lost the rear end so i don't think it was something like that just maybe something bent underneath and raised the front i don't know what it is well a memorable first visit to the banks of michigan we're just delighted that you're okay well, thank you. All right. He heads in for further treatment with Dr. Olvey and company here, and we'll send it back to Paul. That's his first DNF since his accident at Phoenix. And I just have a quick comment to make about Michael Andretti. So we know he jumped on the brakes. But consider this. All the front-running cars here run carbon fiber brakes on this particular racetrack, the Super Speedway. Michael probably used his left foot. When you stab the brakes with carbon fiber, they bite so severely, watch it here, instantly smokes those front tires for an instant, and that's it. You lose your steering, you lose your line, you out of the groove, and you smack the concrete. That may have contributed to him hitting the wall. So under unusual circumstances, two leaders of this race, Nigel Mansell, and now Michael Andretti out, and one of the contenders, Jack Villeneuve, also out. We are still under our third yellow. At the Marlboro 500, lap 84 being completed under the yellow. The nice smile, Raul Boisel is the leader of the race. Will he be smiling like that at the end of the day? In second place is Mario Andretti. Al Unser Jr. has moved up into third position, as has his Penske teammate, Emerson Fittipaldi, closed in, now running in fourth. Former winner of the Marlboro 500, Scott Goodyear, sits in fifth place. And a rookie here, despite all of his starts in Indianapolis, but his first start here, the fastest rookie, Dominic Dobson, sits in sixth position. And we're on board with Robbie Gordon. He needs some help here. His fastest lap so far is only in the 223 range. The three fastest cars are all in the 225s. So Gordon does not have enough speed yet. Now remember the fire in the Gallus pits. Adrian Fernandez jumping out of the car. He's with Gary Jarrell. Well, Adrian Fernandez, uh, you we reported we're okay. You told us you were all right. They checked you out and your crew. Everybody seems to be okay. What was that moment like when you sat there strapped in that cockpit and all of a sudden there's this horrendous fire? Well, first I, you know, they uh, first the problem was that we were missing some uh, of our crew members because one was having a baby. So we changed the guys. So Owen went to the rear tire. So what happened was um, he gave me the, you know, the go ahead when the fuel was still on. So when I pulled, the car was a little bit. So then it's when you know the thing was starting to flame, and then it's when I start to feel inside a lot of heat. And somebody struck me out. I went out of the car, and somebody from the Newman Haas team just, uh, you know, poured me out of water. So I thank them for that. Well, we're thankful that you're all right. Now, as far as the race was concerned, you were running up there in the top five and looked like you had a great afternoon going. Yeah, my car was great. You know, we, when we restarted the race after that yellow flag, you know, the way I was passing people, you know, I, I knew my car was good. I passed, uh, and then I was starting to pass uh, Pitti Paldi and then Paul Tracy. My car was working so good. So it's a shame, but, you know, we're here for a long time. So the good thing is that everybody in the team is okay. Indeed. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you. Shows you how closely knit these teams are. Owen Snyder, who normally is on the right front, wasn't there, and it's just enough of a confusion as they head out to cause a serious problem for Adrian Fernandez. We'll be back. Many surprises here today for this gigantic crowd that sits under a beautiful blue sky. Some clouds up there, but it's nice and warm. Track temperatures about 110 degrees when they started this race. We are under our third yellow of the day. Now, these IndyCar safety teams and crews, they do a lot of work throughout the year to make sure that these cars are safe, but they go to great lengths to ensure the safety of the drivers most effectively. Gary Gerald explains IndyCar's state-of-the-art emergency facilities. When an on-track incident occurs, there's an immediate response from at least one of three safety vehicles manned by a doctor and three paramedics who are also skilled as firefighters and extrication specialists. The safety trucks carry hydraulic extrication equipment that can be used to free drivers trapped in a damaged race car, as well as chemical fire retardant and water. Video cameras atop the safety trucks record the response and rescue efforts for later reassessment and evaluation. From the incident scene, a driver is transported to the IndyCar Medical Center a 40-foot coach that serves as a small hospital emergency room on wheels. Here, orthopedic and trauma surgeons continue efforts to stabilize the condition of the injured party while evaluating needs for possible off-site treatment. 
The medical staff has at its disposal x-ray equipment, ventilation devices to control breathing, defibrillators and cardiac monitors, IV fluids, chest tubes, and advanced cardiac life support drugs. Virtually everything you'd find in a hospital emergency room to handle anything from minor injuries to full trauma. Should further treatment be necessary, helicopter transport is available to airlift the injured driver to a local medical center. IndyCar officials are justifiably proud of their safety team, and plans are being finalized for an expanded state-of-the-art medical facility five times larger than the existing version. You won't find better dedication than you find on the safety crews of the IndyCars. There is that safety coach sitting back in the garage area here. I've been there. I've been in every one of those facilities. You can't imagine what a comfort it is to see the faces that you recognize of the safety team because you know you're in good hands, particularly because you're normally in deep, deep trouble when they arrive. We're a little over a lap from a green flag if everybody gets back on station in terms of the safety crews. They are lined up, of course, behind the PPG base car in an order with Raul Boisel, the leader of the race, followed by Mario Andretti, Alonzo Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi, Scott Goodyear, Dominic Dobson. There's Dick Simon. He's the car owner on Raul's car. Never had a win either when he was as a driver or as a car owner. Years and years in this sport, over 25 years. And Dick Simon could be looking at his first win today, but remember, we are only on the 88th lap of 250. 19 cars are still in the fight. There is a very long way to go. And in just the 88 laps thus far, we've seen so many surprises. Look at how emphatic Dick is. And Dick barks out the orders to everybody else on the team. They brought a new sponsor here this weekend, Alan Tool. What a ride they're having. Do you think Dick is trying hard to get his point across? His wife Diane sits beside him and she calls lots of the pit stops. Roger Penske calls them all for Al Unser Jr. who currently is above 225 miles an hour. That's a little bit slower than Mario and a little bit slower than Raul Bozell. Two distinctly different management styles there, eh? <laughs> Al Unser Jr. who sits currently in third place. Raul Boisel is the leader. There he is, car number five. As the pace car picks up the pace going into the third turn. And Raul now will bring the field back. He does it right. He should be picking it up, and he is. We watch for the green flag. Pace car will take it down off the court. Alan Jr. has the distance to make up. And look what a great restart Raul got. both of those drivers have to make up. Mario is second on the back stretch. Two down from the Goodyear blimp, holding over Michigan International Speedway. 18 degrees of banking here. And it is a high-speed traffic jam. If you run fast here, the straight line speed is about 240 miles an hour. Your slowest speed at any point on the track can be above 225 miles an hour. Al Jr. ducked down inside as Jeff Wood experiences a flat left rear tire in the Euro Motorsport car and limps his way back to pit lane. Hopefully we'll keep it down. Yep, you got it down and off so we don't see another yellow. Hunter Jr. and Fittipaldi splitting slower traffic as they were moving around. And Jeff Wood all the way into the pits now. He's safe as they pursue this man, Mario Andretti. Currently running in second. Stefan Johansson with a tire down on the left rear. Now do we have to ask a question about the tires? Two of them right in a row there. Was there debris left on the course from that last, ac last accident? We are having an inordinate number of tire problems here. I don't want to say they're tire failures because remember, debris that cuts the tire down can cause the problem. We're back yellow. Let's go to Gary. And with that yellow out, they work here to change all of the tires for Stefan Johansson. Now he gets back out. Bosell, however, crosses the start-finish line, and this is going to be a costly delay for Stefan Johansson. And the reason they threw the yellow is debris. When they see two cars like that in succession limp down to the pit lane, they have
have to go and inspect the racetrack, and Al Jr. takes the opportunity to make a stop. So both of those went up in the turn three area where Villeneuve just had his accident. Well, apparently some more parts up there. Is that a logical conclusion? That could well be. Tires, but thankfully, our leaders, those L in particular, seem to be able to stay clear as does Barry Emerson and Al Jr. 9.1 seconds of changing time on Al Unser Jr.'s tire. Raul Boisel, boy, look at this. You talk about taking the tire apart. And of course, most of that damage happens on the drive back to the pit lane. This particular wheel is from Stefan Johansson's car, but the damage it does to the bodywork and the suspension can also be substantial. Yeah, it would it would be unfair to suggest that the tire was that way immediately. It drove all the way into the pits to get into that condition. So at Michigan, once again, we are under yellow. It is our fourth of the day, 92 laps complete. Back at Michigan International Speedway, they just made an inspection out on the track. They have found a couple of uh, parts out there. Jan Vikas, you have a further update for us. Well, the field manager for Goodyear is John Slicker. Now, John, we've seen a lot of tires go down. What is the cause of this? Well, it's a real tough track to run. You get a lot of punctures out here. You know, because of the high speeds, we have to run a, a very thin tread cap. And what happens is that you know, you've seen a few accidents and a little bit of debris gets on the track and you can cut a tire very easily. Just saw with Stefan Johansson there was a cut in that. Do you know what happened with Robbie Gordon's? Because that was before there was ever an accident. Right, we have Robbie's Gordon tire. You know, we don't see anything that was wrong with the tire. Uh, you know, I can't really explain it. We've been running, you know, for the last couple of days, everything we've been running just fine. So we have no reason to think we have any sort of a problem. Okay, thank you, John. Well, gentlemen, one thing to keep in mind, it's the carbon fibers after a crash that seems to be puncturing these tires because they're very sharp. So pieces of the body work. Robbie Gordon, remember he had his problems earlier in the day. He's back trying to get back in this fight as best he can. He's in sixth position right now, but still a lap behind the leader. Let's go to Gary. Well, here's an interesting story from the Penske cab on how they're addressing this problem of losing tire pressure. If you run over a piece of debris and the pressure starts to go down. For the first time under race conditions today, every one of the wheels on every Penske car has one of these little cylinders mounted inside the spoke work. And in this cylinder is a battery-operated transmitter and they set this mechanism so that it monitors air pressure. You run over debris and the pressure drops by a pound or more, this unit sends a signal to an onboard com computer on the chassis. And then by telemetry, that information is fed to the pits so that within a matter of seconds, they know, I have a warning, that they may be in danger of a tire going down. Now this won't help you in a blowout, but it'll help you if you run over one of those pieces of carbon fiber and debris. This is an offshoot of what happened to Emerson Fittipaldi a year ago last spring at Phoenix. When Paul Tracy was leading and crashed, Emerson ran over debris and they didn't know it. His tire went down, he crashed, he lost 20 points for a possible win. He lost the championship by less than 20 points last year and a million dollar prize that goes for winning the PPG IndyCar Championship. So this little device, new for the first time under race conditions, may give the Penske team a slight advantage today. And with the tires we've seen going down, this could be a big piece of information for them. Very smart piece of equipment, but I wonder with all the telemetry, the driver, drivers are running out of excuses. Gary, you mentioned it won't help you in the case of a blowout, but we do. We, we must remember the blowouts are caused mostly because the air does leak out. So in fact, it really does help stop those blowouts. Raul Boisel picks up the pace once again. We are ready to go back to green. We'll go back on lap 95. Four yellow periods, 34 total laps of yellow here today. As Raul comes back up at speed. Closing behind him is Goodyear. He runs in fifth place a lap down, looking for Mario Andretti. There he is. Mario Andretti, the second place car. Fittipaldi and Unser Jr. were closing on Mario before this last yellow. Well, they close again as Mario comes around to refuel Guzmi. Favorite high line gets away from everybody else. Moves high. That's Tracy. The other Penske that he now follows. Tracy still back now back up the screen having had that front steering problem earlier, but there's Mario, goes way high up to the outside wall. That's where he likes to run. Now he comes down, he gets the slip screen. Paul Tracy to the high side. Tracy runs three laps behind the leader in 15th position. 
Slipstream and drafting so important at our super speedway like this year. You might ask, how far behind the other car can you begin to pick up that draft with that slipstream? Nigel Mansell told me earlier, as, as far as 100 yards behind the car, you can feel the turn in the air and begin to feel that suck. So it's very effective here. Got a glimpse of Emerson Fittipaldi and then Paul Tracy. Now back to Mario Andretti, second place. Behind Raul Boisel. Raul is 5.7 seconds ahead already. Dominic Conte is just ahead of Mario. Fittipaldi two seconds back from Mario Andretti. There's Fittipaldi. Is on as we know the Penske's are looking for the reliability that you need to have for 500 mile races. Emerson is on the pace. He doesn't have the ultimate speed. 221 miles an hour. As fast as Emerson has gone all afternoon. There's four guys. 31 car, Alan Sir Jr. And Al Jr. does have the speed. 225 he did back in last those four cars run on the leader lap. Scott Goodyear is in fifth place, one lap behind the leaders. Robbie Gordon, he's in sixth, a lap behind. Bet he couldn't take advantage of the yellows and get up and back onto the leader lap. He was so powerful in the early going until that tire let go. Well, he hasn't had a fair shake yet, but there is such a long way to go yet in this race. All he needs is to catch some of these yellows properly he can get back on the lead lap. But Gordon definitely displaying a new maturity and discipline in his driving. Because since Australia, he has been meticulous as we look over his shoulder at the Ford Electronics telemetry. 200 miles now complete, 100 laps into the record book of the Marlboro 500. You can see he put three the throttle and then back on at two. Let's watch him at three and four. Flat, little breather, and then back flat at the end of three and all the way down to four. Watch the miles per hour. Now what's essentially the front straight? In fact, it is a long turn. 230 miles an hour and diver down into turns one and then up the bank into two. He made several adjustments there as we watch Al Unser Jr. Closing on Teo Fabi, the ninth place car. Left behind the lead of the race. But while we were watching Robbie Gordon, he moved his hand down a couple of times. Is that readjusting the electronics on the dash display? It's the real mixture that makes the adjust. Left the pump off valve is beginning to open, and the driver has a monitor tube in his helmet right beside his ear. The pump off valve is just open. Little sip, sip, sip of air. As will tell him, turn it down a notch or two. Don't be too greedy with the pop off valve. Just get reliable horsepower. To the pits once again, Jan Vegas. Well, speaking about Robbie Gordon, he made a change in the front of the car, the steering arm. We checked with Tim Warjob, his engineer. We said, is the toe on the car okay? He says, well, it's very close, but not perfect. When Derek mentioned that he had to lift just a little in those turns, that's why. The front end's not perfect, but right now he's still running very quickly to trying to make up that time loss. Yeah, laps at 223.8 for his last lap. As we ride again with Robbie Gordon, gave you a look down through the entire field, including the cars out. Robbie takes the high line. Surface change comes off and watch the traffic how fast he catches it. Sometimes you don't know whether it's safer to go outside between the traffic and the wall. In that case, the traffic moves right down to get more that clear outside run. Oh, he has a big speed. Currently runs in seventh place. One of the two Pack West cars, Robbie Gordon. Overhauled the teammate just a few moments ago, Scott Sharp, the rookie here. Well, we watched Dominic. Good run for Dominic Dobson. Qualified ninth. A lot of people started on the outside off road three has behaved himself. It was a very good run for a new team. Pack West 
This particular team, Pac West, made headlines yesterday on some sort because they announced they will test Danny Sullivan in this particular car on Tuesday at the current official test at Middle Ohio. Dominic Dobson, the fastest rookie here, which surprised me because you always you think of him in connection with the Indy 500 as we watch Emerson Fittipaldi continuing to work his way through traffic. Changes his line. Jr., the 31 car, is closing on Fittipaldi. Jan Bikas, you have an update on these cars. Well, I sure do. They started off the race, Paul, conservatively, and they were pushing. Both Alan Jr. and Anderson Fittipaldi have been in, and they have both of them more front wing. So both these two drivers much happier with the balance of their car right now. This is the battle on the track as Hunter Jr. closes on Fittipaldi. Boisel, six seconds ahead of second place Mario Andretti. This is a fight among the teammates. There are no team orders, certainly at this early stage of the race. Hunter Jr. has been able to see Emerson for the last five or six laps. He knows he has the speed, and he just needs to be patient. He knows he's going to pull that to the slipstream. Well, in just a few laps. Across the line, 1.3 seconds back. Last time across. Al's improving on that now. the stripe. Tracy in the pits again. No factor in this race. Five laps behind the lead. 13th position. Now it becomes a test session. Like Gain experience, but here are the teammates. Locked in battle here. This is for position. This is for a third place, and Unser Jr. closes in. Now Unser Jr. whittled two tenths off on the last lap. What he does here. Definitely in contact with third place Emerson Fittipaldi. Half his year facing drivers during the season. Alistair Jr. has only been home twice in Albuquerque for seven days since May 1st. On the road doing testing or racing or promotional work. These boys are busy during the season. But look at this now. In the slip frame, we know it's a vector from 100 yards behind. And here goes the slingshot. Alistair Jr. makes it. Now. Look how fast he comes down on Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi with slower traffic just ahead. Little Al up on the high side. Fittipaldi trapped by that slower traffic, but will Al get trapped now on the back stretch? Inside of Mark Smith. So all the Penskys are in the group here. Tracy moves aside. But Al Unser Jr. clearly outhandles Emerson. You have to make the car around that turn two. Emerson is off the power. Al Jr. is on it hard. Al Unser, he loves to drive it fast. He'll tell you his favorite tracks are the high-speed super speedways. He is so good on them. No wonder he likes them so much. Let's go to the pits. John Beacus with an update on Emerson Fittipaldi. Yes, when we just saw those cars, each Penske car going by, it turns out that Emerson Fittipaldi is getting that push back again. In the next pit stop, in about 10 or 12 laps, he's going to try to go either for more front wing or actually reduce the wicker at the rear. Alistair Jr., obviously more balanced than Emerson, who's got the push. Little Al comes alongside of Scott Sharp. And looks for racing room. And push is the problem. But that leads to the symptom which is what slows you down. The symptoms are you have to back out of the power to control the push. But that's why we saw Al Jr. blast by. The leader of the race, Raul Boisel, 4.25 seconds ahead of second place, Mario Andretti, driving his last 500. And Gerald's in Michael, uh, Mario's pit. Who's where? Do it again. America's most enduring images, the Goodyear blimp. Overhead giving us an aerial view. 
here at the Marlboro 500. Raul Boisel out by 1.8 seconds ahead of Mario Andretti. Pit stops do. Errol Mashushta already into the Dick Simon pits, getting some fast service out of that crew. But we're expecting the leader of the race to come into the pit right next door at any time now. Probably about two laps away. There is second place Mario Andretti. It is in long and illustrious career. How many 500 mile race wins for Mario Andretti who heads into the pits? Take a guess. Surprise me. Three. Indian 69. Michigan here in 84. And at 86 at Pocono. Let's go to Gary Terrell. Well, it's his 67th and final 500 mile event. Just think about that. So many in the great career. He had been closing on Bosell, but he's the first in this sequence to make the stop. Everything appears to be routine. We don't see any changes, front or rear, waiting for the fueling. Now he's rolling 13. Oh, problem! The jacks went back down. Cars hung up. Now they get the jack back up, and he's away, but they lost precious seconds. The, the jack apparently engaged again, and as he tried to move forward, it was gouging into the asphalt, and he just couldn't go. Well, it engaged because the hose was still hooked to the car. That's it. What happened, Gary, was they couldn't actually release the air hose, and they are furious. Donnie is furious there. They couldn't release the hose. Donnie goes back and talks to his engineer, Brian Lyles, but Mario can be thankful that the crew member stopped him because he would have had to make another run around all the way as Bozell comes in. And terribly frustrating for those crew members. Here is the leader of the race, Anyon Vegas. Here he is, our leader, Raul Boisel. Obviously, the way things have been going, they hope for just some smooth pit work here from the Dick Simon team. Okay, the outside front is done. We're looking for changes. At the moment, they have not touched this car. Obviously, very happy with the handling. Fuel's in, and he is up. 15.3 for Boisel. But Boisel comes out of the pits. Mario Andretti slows down on the track. Hopefully not the end of his day. Came out of the pits and slowed down. It's hard to believe that we see Mario again running slow on a 500-mile race. He had been the fastest car on the racetrack, averaging above 228 miles an hour, and it is over. Incredible for Mario. He pulls in on a part of the old road course here at Michigan International. His final 500 has come to an end. He was so much in this fight. Mario Andretti alone out on the backside of the track. And Allinger Jr., the 31 car, picks up the lead of the race. Due for a stop any time now. It's been 30 laps since his last pit stop as he closes on Stefan Johansson. Alonso Jr., who pays no real attention to qualifying, has come from 14th as we join the Robbie Gordon Scott Goodyear battle. Gordon Little Pope down the inside. He is currently running in fourth place. Scott Goodyear is. Rosella's fifth. Uh, Goodyear. Robbie Gordon takes fourth away from Goodyear. I knew it was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so it changes at the top of the order with still some stops to be made. Alonso Jr. leads, followed by Pinacoldi. Mario slows to a stop. That takes him out of the competition. Raul Boisel comes out of the pits in third place as we go yellow. And the assumption is a debris yellow. No obvious incident on the course. And the yellow may be what will help Robbie Gordon and Scott Goodyear. They were down a lap. They just need to go all the way around to get back on that leader lap. The car passes. Both of his cars are gone. They have decided that Mario and Reddy's car is in a precarious position, and so they're going to pull him in from that position out on the race course. That is the reason for this, the fifth yellow of the day. And Allenzer Jr. takes advantage of it and heads down for some Penske service. So here's a tremendous advantage for little Al. They can take their time. They're not under any pressure whatsoever. Pittipaldi, second place in as well. Gary Gerald's right there. Interesting conversation leading up to this stop under yellow regarding Emerson Fittipaldi, who is now listed in second place. They couldn't make up their minds if they wanted to take wing out of the nose, reduce the size of the wicker bill at the rear. Emerson changed his mind, we're told, twice, and then they decided no changes whatsoever. He's back out, Paul. 
that was the time and the time is gone. So as we watch Robbie Gordon head for the pits, we are under yellow for the fifth time of the day with the 125th lap complete at Michigan. Back at the Marlboro 500 at Michigan as Mario Andretti was towed back to the pit area and then made the turn back into the garage area. His day and his final 500 mile race obviously done. So both of Carl Haas's cars, first Nigel Mansell, the early leader out of the race, now Mario Andretti, a definite contender for this the first half of the race. We're past, just past the 250 mile mark. Jan Bikas moves in very close to Mario right now. Raul Boisel is the leader under the yellow. Munzer Jr. is second. Emerson Fittipaldi is third. Robbie Gordon is fourth. Scott Goodyear is fifth. This is under the yellow. Fifth of the day. 38 laps of the 127 lap run have been run under the yellow flag. Those eyes tell you so much. Jan Bikas. Mario. We heard it was an engine problem. Is that what let loose? Yeah. That's a tough way to end your last 500 mile race, isn't it? Yeah, especially the way the car was working. You had a good shot at winning this today, you think? Uh, I think so. I mean, the car was really working well, and uh, just now we were just getting on to the proper staggers, and uh, I could run 26, 27s, you know, and I was catching Raul, so, uh, you know, I was being fairly patient, you know, a long way to go. Shame, because, um, this is probably the best I ever had a car working here. Now talk about the incident, if you may, in the pits. When you came in, it was all flooded with water. Obviously, that was a very tricky situation also. Well, that lost us quite a bit because uh, they almost put me down a lap. Well, Mario obviously needs to get moved out of the way. Even when you're Mario Andretti, we have to keep this area clear. Paul? Well, this was Mario Andretti. This was not the water incident. This is the one where the hose was still attached. That's the hose that supplies the pressure to the jacks. They got it disengaged. It shouldn't have caused any problem to the car. Only consolation, Mario still leaves here as officially the fastest man in the world on a closed course racetrack. Of course, he set that time above 234 miles an hour, qualifying on the pole here last year. But did you see the pain in his eyes? The Valvoline race recap. We're at the halfway point just beyond it now. Roy Boisel has averaged 154 miles an hour. We had five lead changes, five leaders, six lead changes, five yellow flag laps. We're actually up at the 39th yellow flag lap right now. Nine cars are out of the run here. These are the cars out of the race. And there are some fairly substantial names in there. Both of the Hondas, Nigel Mansell, Jimmy Vassar had a wheel bearing let go. Adrian Fernandez at fire in the pits. Michael Andretti while leading. Eddie Cheever driving for A.J. Foyt with his electrical problem. The accident involving Jacques Villeneuve. That's at 125 laps of the halfway point. We've been under yellow since then at 128 laps. And of course, Mario Andretti just fell out of the race. So we are still under yellow here. Just past the halfway. And we promised you some surprises. We've had them thus far. We're back at the Marlboro 500 at Michigan. 129 laps complete, 250 laps of scheduled distance. One lap to go back to the green flag. Jens Wintall, the official starter for the IndyCar, signals them. But look at what happens here. Raul Boisel is the leader of the race. Allenser Jr. and Emerson Fittipaldi right behind, second and third. But they've got a little distance. They have to get around tail Fabi before they get in contact with the leader. And then some other cars back in the field. But the key, Derek Daly, is that Robbie Gordon and Scott Goodyear have made up all that distance and are running fourth and fifth on the leader lap. And we are not convinced that Goodyear has the speed to run with this leading group. We do think Robbie Gordon, who's almost at 224 miles an hour, can give these leading three a bit of a headache. But as the race goes on here, some of the cars get faster. Unser Jr. is now above 226. you got to look, too, at Ari Leyendijk there. You will see him come up here in a second as we go through the field. He started in 28th position. Leyendijk now sits in ninth place. There he is. What a spectacular run for him. Good one for Leyendijk. Terrible qualifying session here. New engineer on board for this team, Brian Berthold getting his rapport working with Lion Dyke, but Lion Dyke a specialist on these high-speed super speedways. He will take this particular car to Holland 
on Tuesday for an IndyCar demonstration at Sandport, the old Grand Prix racing circuit. Gary Terrell, update on Ari Leondyke as we're ready for green. His confidence soared because he went faster in the final warm-up this morning than he qualified. We're ready for green, Paul. Back under speed. Raul Boisel down on the inside with slower traffic alongside. Not that much slower, sorry. And the two Penske cars, Unser Jr. and Fittipaldi as Scott Goodyear makes a move on Robbie Gordon gets past him for the moment. They are battling for fourth place. And this is a battle, as you say, for position. Good. Gordon is down the outside. He's in a traffic jam. Oh, they split on both sides of slower cars. There's Fittipaldi coming down the inside. Back on Gordon now as he continues his battle with Goodyear. So as they come back to green, we have fights breaking out all over this track. Only one that seems safe at the moment is Raul Boisel. There's Scott Goodyear. There was a report as he came back to green that he may be having some shifting problems with his car. Didn't look like it as he came back to green, but then he fell off on speed just a little bit. We'll keep an eye on his car. Nevertheless, whatever it was, it got him around Gordon. Scott Goodyear again takes a high line here. Came here with a new setup put on by John Dick. Much softer than the ever ran before here. Believe it or not, over the bumps, he liked it. He was fast, he was comfortable and confident this morning, and now for the first time in a long time, he is in a top four position in an IndyCar race. Well, Scott Goodyear had some disappointments this year, including at Indianapolis, back on board, Robbie Gordon. Gordon has come back a bit. He returned the last lap at 223 miles an hour, but fell a second and a half behind Scott Goodyear. Let's go to the pits and yawn. Standing by, yes, we are in Gordon's pit, and at the moment, they are trying to figure out what could be the cause of him dropping back. We'll have that answer for you shortly, but they thought going to green, the car was perfect. Derek Walker, the car owner, still seems satisfied. A bit of a smile there, whatever it is, it's not a kind of yet. And announced yesterday that Robbie Gordon, his crown jewel and his team, signed a three-year contract remain with the Valvoline Cummins racing team. Now, what they didn't say in the press release is Gordon does have a buyout option should he want to go to Formula One in 1997. But Gordon is on board, and what a jewel he is for Derek Walker to have. And it's a surprise. A number of people have speculated that that was going to be the second driver with Michael Andretti at Newman Haas, even though there was some indication that that would not have been Michael's choice. Gary Gerald, do you have an update on Scott Goodyear? We just checked with John Dick, and he said the problem for Goodyear is really a mini problem. His gear selector indicator, which is on the dash in the cockpit, is not functioning properly. But the sequence of the sequential shift is correct, so the car is working good. It's just the indicator that's not working. And remember, Scott Goodyear broke through here two years ago to win his first and only IndyCar event. Well, IndyCar has raced for 83 years without a gear selection indicator on the dash. I bet he can go to the end without it. But this is the 90s, and it's great to see John Dick working well with Goodyear. John Dick had his own team. He was in partnership with Tim Duke in performance. They ran John Paul earlier, particularly at the Speedway. Now he moves over to try and help Goodyear with Kenny Bernstein's foot wide. Robbie Gordon just cut the last lap a mile an hour faster than Scott Goodyear, so he's closing again. Not to make too much light of Goodyear's problem with that indicator, the old H pattern, especially with some of the race cars actually having a visible gate, you could see where you were in the pattern. But with sequential, it's really helpful to know exactly what gear you're in. Oh, look at Gordon around the outside in turn three again. Let's go to the pitch, John Vegas. Well, Paul, now we have had the opportunity to check with Tim Wardrop, and he said all it was was not having the right timing in traffic. It turned out that Scott Goodyear had the better timing. They do not see a problem with Robbie. Things are going just the way. Obviously, they're very excited about getting that lap back. Scott Goodyear continues to run about a mile an hour slower than Robbie Gordon. So Gordon very much in pursuit, but traffic is a factor here. Gordon high alongside tail Bobby is a second and a half behind Scott Goodyear in the ongoing battle for fourth. Raul Boisel is still the leader, and then the two Pesky cars, Alan Sir Jr. and Emerson Fittipaldi. Don't forget the speed being demonstrated.
frustrated by Dominic Dobbs, and we saw him flash out behind Teo Fabi. They almost clipped Fabi. Dobson, who was running speeds above 223 miles an hour, also giving a good account of himself here. Seven seconds behind Ari Leyendijk. The moment unchallenged running alone. Back on board with Robbie Gordon. The Michigan 500, 13 races, 12 different winners. The only two-time winner, Michael Andretti. And he's out of this run here today. Eric Walker keeps track of his driver in fifth place, Robbie Gordon. The PPG IndyCar World Series is being brought to you by American Honda, who has been making quality cars in America for the past 11 years, and by PPG, world leaders in automotive finishes. Back at the Marlboro 500 at Michigan, Mauricio Bouchard and Mateo Bobby fighting one another on the course. They're actually separated by a lap in competition, but they have hooked up with one another. There is an indication coming from the observers that there may be a rear wing vibration in that car. A moment ago, you were looking at the front wings and didn't find any, anything, but you obviously some, some, saw something you were concerned with. Very difficult to pick up a vibration when you look from the TV cameras, but you can see the little flutter there. Bougeman may be aware of that. The Kami dad of twin boys just two weeks ago. some vibration. So we'll keep an eye on Mauricio Guzman. Raul Boisel is the leader by three seconds over Al Hunter Jr. Guzman runs in 11th place. There's your leader, Raul Boisel. Potential first victory in the Indy cars for Raul. First for Dick Simon. After years as both a driver and a car owner. But the Penske cars are lined up second and third. We'll certainly have something to say about that before the race is over. 146 laps complete. Now, let's take a look at the interval. You saw Raul. There is the second place car, Al Unser Jr. So just 2.79 seconds as they cross the line that time. And Al Unser Jr. at the moment is faster than Bozell. In fact, his fastest lap is 2.26.8 for Jr. 2.26.1 for Bozell. He goes inside his teammate, Marco Greco. Dick Simon mentioned earlier, we think we can get this car perfect. I don't think it's perfect yet. He needs a little bit more speed if he is to fend off the challenge of that man there, number three in your picture, Alan Sir Jr. 1.7 last time around. Alan Sir Jr. is definitely closing. The last lap, Alan Sir Jr. was seven tenths of a mile faster. 26-1 for Raul, 226-8 for Little Al. And Al Jr. is superb at wearing him down. Chase him, chase him, hound him, keep the car on the meat. Don't stress it mechanically, a long way to go. He is a master at these 500 mile races and understanding track position. Track position means just stay within sight of the leader, then make your, make your attack. Al Unser Jr. fell back a little bit, the 2.26 seconds behind Raul as they came across the last line. That was the traffic that he had to encounter. Fortunately, the computer support of the EDS scoring system really helped in being able to determine how fast they're running, how close the interval, who's closing on what and where. Available all up and down the line to the crew. Remember, the best car, run by Dick Simon, is a private team. It's not, this is not the factory-supported Lola team or factory-supported Cosworth team. So it just shows you that you can buy a production car from Lola in England or Rayner, go and race head-to-head -head with the cream of the crop like Penske Racing. Well, Gary Gerald out on the course. Al Hunter Jr. is trying to reel Raul Boisel in. Dick Simon is very aware, of course, of that dwindling interval. We asked him how concerned, and he says the problem is that he picked up a bit of a push on this current set of tires after the last stop. They'll try to weather it till the next stop, try to make an adjustment there, hope for a better balance on the car, hoping, meanwhile, that they can keep that two-second advantage over Little Al. Dick Simon, early today, before this race, told me 
I guarantee you, if we can run 500 miles, we will win this race because we are the fastest car. Well, right now, they've got a little glitch with this set of tires, and they're hanging on, Paul. Yeah, but they don't have that long to wait. They made their last stop 31 laps ago, so I would guess within the next five laps, they would bring that car in. Alonzer Jr., on the other hand, is only 27 laps out, so you would guess that he'll take over the lead of, ra of the race, at least for a while. Yes, indeed. Now, we watched very closely on the last pit stop when we saw Brozell making it. There were no adjustments made to the car, so we can only presume that it was the tire imbalance that is causing his push. The tire pressures may be different, or there may be a very slight stagger difference on the rear tire, and it doesn't take much to give you a push, and then the Alonso Juniors will pounce. The interval back to 1.7 seconds. Raul Brozell to Alonso Jr. Fittipaldi is well back. Well, Junior just turned the heat up. We just did a lap of 227.8 miles an hour. The longer this race goes, the faster Alonso Jr. gets to Brozell. Pulls down for the slipstream of tail Bobby in the pins oil Boy, just like that car is on rails. What a beautiful day they're having. Raul, who loves these high-speed ovals and does so well on them. How can you say somebody deserves a win? But everybody seems to say Bozell deserves a win. Maybe his time will come today. He has been so close so many times, all the way back to the mid-'80s when he was on the front row with Dick Simon and race way back then. He never managed to just capture the champagne on the bumper. Two years ago at Indianapolis, so very much in the early going of the race, and then a penalty takes him out, one that many of the teams questioned was an appropriate penalty anyway. On to Milwaukee. Hole there. Not a good result in the race, though. Same thing this year. Hole at Milwaukee. No victory. Raul Poisel would be cheered all up and down these pits if he would score a victory here today. Back to the battle for fourth place. Scott Goodyear and Robbie Gordon. Gordon on the right of your screen begins to close in as Goodyear encounters the traffic. Now this is a great high-speed battle here again. We're over Gordon's shoulder. He takes the outside room. He gets gray when you get too high. He passes. Marco hoping that Goodyear gets blocked in traffic. And of course, Goodyear wants to try and make all the right moves. So it's good to stay back. What an incredible run Gordon is having here. Right front tire lets go in the early going when he's running up in the front. He falls several laps behind the race. He's now caught up and is challenging for fourth place. He, by the way, is the most consistent driver thus far this year coming to this race. 1,062 laps Gordon has completed. That's the most of any driver in competition this season. Lap count in the IndyCar. Now he continues his challenge. Raul Boisel as Al Hunter is closed in again. Now just under a half a second behind. Oh, look at the run off turn two. Look at the run junior high. Here we go. The crowd comes to their feet and begins to cheer as Hal Unser Jr. comes to the lead of the race around Raul Boisel. Boisel's not going to let it go that easy, though. And remember, Raul is beginning to think about a pit stop. Listen to that crowd. Everybody in the front grandstand here are on their to cheer Alonso Jr., but we saw him outhandle as his wife Shelley watches. We saw him outhandle Emerson between turn two and the first race of Dick Simon's If face. you were Dick Simon, would you not bring him in right now and make the changes and get him out? He's in the zone anyway. He's got to calculate how many more stops he needs before the end of this race. But if he's in deep trouble, he'll lose way too much time on the racetrack. Sometimes it is better to stop. Look at the lead out. Jr. pulls out in just one lap. Way to Al Unser Jr. and in fact Fittipaldi shouldn't be too far behind Raul now as well. 217 miles an hour was Bozell's last lap, so he may be in trouble. We may see a pit stop very soon for Bozell. Looking back for Fittipaldi as well. And there comes Emo. 
as he closes on Raul Boisel. So Alan Sir Jr. has picked up the lead of the Marlboro 500. The winner of the Michigan 500 is he on his way to making an, uh, the Indy 500. Is he on his way to making it two in a row in 500 mile races and lots more points for the PPT Championship? The battle continues here in Michigan. Boisel running in second place, 42 laps since his last stop comes in. Hopefully they can get a good change on that car, Gary Gerald. This team had been practicing its pit proficiency earlier today. Richie Simon on the right front already has made the change. They're waiting for the fuel. Now there's a wing adjustment. It's a dramatic one. Turns look like two turns on both sides from Richie Simon. Waiting for the fuel. Now he's rolling. About 15, 16 seconds plus, Paul. And as he rolls out, Al Unser Jr. comes into the pits for his service on the 164 lap. Jan Vikas. Well, he brings it to a stop right on the marks, Paul. We're going to keep a careful eye out for changes on this car. The changes that you will see will be in the front wing area if they decide to go for any at all. Okay, we've got all the tires changed. It's on the jacks. Well, this is a little bit different. They went off the jacks earlier, and now they're just waiting for the fuel. Al Unser Jr., 15, just a lower 15. He's out of here. So stops by first and second. Raul Boisel will keep an eye on his times now as he gets it up to speed. His first lap out of the pits at 226 miles an hour. And Scott Goodyear picks up the lead of the race with those stops. And we've got Guzelman in trouble coming out of the pits. Looks like he was on a pit exit. Maybe the wheel came off, who knows? That looks like what it is. From here, now we did get the report earlier that he did have a vibration or felt a vibration. I don't know whether that was the cause of this. No yellow. Guzelman, who was having a superb run. And what they're doing, it sounds like, the officials are gonna close the pits. If they're doing it, they're doing it at a... They decided yellow for the pits only. That will keep them open. That means Scott Goodyear and Robbie Gordon are now battling for the lead of this race. You're on board, Gordon. That's Goodyear just ahead. And Gordon is out of sync with the pit stop. We know that because of what happened with that tire explosion earlier that he was so lucky to get away with. But what a battle now we have for the lead. Goodyear, who would have believed this? And Robbie Gordon. Ah, but Robbie Gordon and Scott Goodyear made their last stop on the same lap 42 laps ago as Gordon heads into the pits. Goodyear stays out. Jan Vikas, here comes Robbie Gordon for you. You got it, and what you're gonna watch for is one of the brakes locking up, there it is. Well, both are locked up. Well, boy, we call that one, Paul. He's been coming in here and locking up the brakes. He did it again today, but he stopped it right where he wanted to. Earlier, Derek talked about those carbon fiber brakes. They are, oh, there we see a wing change also. Half turn on the front wings. Very hard to get the car stopped when those carbon fiber brakes are cold. Obviously, too much front bias for Robbie Gordon. 17 4 for Robbie Gordon. Why would they even use carbon fiber brakes? They're much more expensive. Reason being, much lighter on all four corners. Less on the front way. The car handles much better over the, some of the severe bumps here at Michigan. So there's no confusion. There was some talk as Goodyear slows down. Goodyear slows it down. He's out of fuel. He's probably out, exactly. He went 44 laps. Remember that Gordon went 42 and came in. Goodyear has carried it to the 44th lap, and that appears to be too far. And the glory of leading at the Michigan 500 suddenly backfires as Scott Goodyear hopes he makes it down off the banking and all the way down the pit lane to his pit. I don't think he will. Gary Gerald. Well, the crew now is in some, not a state of panic, but a major state of concern. They think that it probably is the fuel situation. They're poised, they're waiting, they're looking. No good year in sight. Oh my, what terrible That's disappointment. Chris Griffin, his chief mechanic, looking down the pit lane. He may have to try and go down and help Goodyear, but he may roll just far enough to get to his pit lane, his pit box. That's going to put him well out of the action, Gary Gerald. It looks like it is fuel. Is the engine running? The engine was not running, I don't think, Paul, and all the noise, but the starter hasn't gone over the wall yet. They're changing the tires. They're getting the fuel. Here comes the starter to the wall. Yeah, no, there's no fire there at all. Now the starter will be engaged. Oh, my. 
Now it turns over once. Fueling still not yet complete. Fueling now complete. Engine turns over again. But when you've run them out of fuel, sometimes it's tough to get them restarted. Now it roars into life, and Scott Goodyear, with all that frustration boiling inside of him, spins the wheels and gets away. All right, throughout of that, the race course stays green, despite the fact that Mauricio Guzman got against the wall on the exit of the pits. They did keep the pits open. Al Unser Jr. picked up the lead of the race. Raul Boisel moved into second place with Emerson Fittipaldi third. Robbie Gordon made his stop, got him out into fourth. But look at him, he's now right on the back end of Emerson Fittipaldi, trying to take third away. And he battles so long and hard against Goodyear and Sergio and hit the position on the plate, but it has lit the fuse inside Robbie Gordon. He is in a battle to possibly win this race. Emerson, oh, he goes outside Willie T. Ribs. Now he's on his favorite high line. Favorite high line chasing the pins. Versus Edgar, here we go. Robbie Gordon tries to the inside. And look how easy he comes by, though. He gives the car a little twitch right on past Fittipaldi, and he sails into third place. Robbie Gordon is coming up through this field for the second time today. Now that pass happened coming on turn two, right under Emerson's rear wing, got the victory, got the draft for the suction, and what a slingshot by by Robbie Gordon's Valvoline Cummins car. We're on board with a man on a mission right now. Being reported out of the race now, Paul Tracy, he's with Gary Carroll. Well, this has been kind of a nightmarish day, and it started early when you banged into a wheel coming down here for that first pit stop and really never got much better, did it? Well, we started picking up some places, and we're getting up into the points, but then we had a, a bad set of tires, and I had to pit again and lost a couple laps, and then ultimately we, we lost a fuel pump or something, no fuel pressure, so it's just a long, a long day. You know, we shouldn't even have been out there. Is this the type of thing that might be of concern to your teammates, Unser and Fittipaldi? Well, I don't think so. I think it was our problem, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look forward to the next race. This, today, we shouldn't even have been out there. Thank you, Paul. In the meantime, on the circuit itself, Al Unser Jr. is being pursued hotly by Raul Boisel in second place. He's just been whittling away on Al for the past couple of laps, but for the moment, this race is being led by Al Unser Jr. 500 backs to back, uh, maybe. Next Saturday, August 6th, the American Bowl. The NFL preseason from Tokyo, Japan. Joe Montana leads the Kansas City Chief against Warren Moon and the Minnesota Vikings. NFL preseason on ESPN, Saturday, August 6th at 10 o'clock Eastern. At the Marlboro 500 at Michigan, Al Unser Jr., the leader of the race, Raul Boisel in second place. Third place is now Robbie Gordon as he got around Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi now in closing position. And the Penske, the more you run on four tanks, the better they get sometimes. Here he comes inside Gordon. That looked very easy. Fittipaldi back into third position. Unusually easy for Fittipaldi as Johansson is in trouble. Stefan Johansson's pit. They work on the spark plugs on the engine, but Johansson stays there, Gary Gerald. Yeah, he's in the cockpit. Kenny Anderson said he radioed to him that it coughed coming down the straightaway. He was in seventh position. Now he's in. They're going through the whole electronics drill, just troubleshooting, hoping that they can find a quick solution, Paul. Check those spark plug wires first and then go through the electrical system, change the black boxes. They've already done that. There's a routine drill for this. And Johansson was absolutely flying. He was almost 227 miles an hour, but he lost two laps. We saw that rear tire go down and then disintegrate earlier in the race. So Johansson, unfortunately, has been an uphill battle, but he has had the speed in Tony Benton's Alex car all this week. The fastest Penske car coming into this race. There is Mark Smith. A little bit of history here. The first time that a Smith has ever driven in a 500-mile race. As Robbie Gordon's in trouble in the pits. Robbie Gordon gets in trouble on the pit road. Did that start on the racetrack and he just came down to this point? He was We're chasing. yellow again. He lost it in turn four, chasing 
Emerson Fittipaldi as team owner Derek Walker can't believe as he looks down to see what happened to Robbie Gordon. IndyCar observers say that the engine let go. That caused the spin. Started in the fourth turn, and he slid all the way into the pits, Jan Vikas. Well, the quick report that we have is that he lost the left rear link in the rear suspension. He was not trying to pit. They were not set up for him. Some sort of suspension problem for Gordon. Well, wait a minute. That's an entirely different report than the observers reported the engine. As Al Unser Jr., as the leader of the race, takes advantage of the yellow. Only 18 laps from his last stop, but on the 183rd, Raul Boisel locks up the brakes coming in as well, taking advantage of the yellow, as did Emerson Fittipaldi. But if it's suspension, are we back to the same question we asked at the start of the, of the program? And that is, is there an inherent engineering problem there that could bite other cars? All these cars, top of the show, take an incredible amount of punishment, and Jan Vikas has more. Jan? Guys, okay, it turns out there was so much going on here that there was two stories. It does appear as though the observers were correct that it was an engine. We'll have to find out why they were talking about suspension here in the Walker pit. We'll check that and let you know later. I'll tell you what, if I'm going to take my, take my choice, I'd much rather it be the engine than suspension. Emerson Fittipaldi making his stop. We're under yellow, the sixth yellow of the day. 44 laps of this race have been run under yellow. Let's take a look at Robbie Gordon's onboard camera. Might give us an idea as, uh, as Fittipaldi just wanted to beat the pace car out. Pass the blend line. So watching the speed limit in the pits, he may not have beat the pace car to oh. the blend line. Otherwise, he would have been on his way long ago. So now, he will have to. So Fittipaldi with a problem. You know, he's unsure. He is unsure. He stopped, looked over to the pace car, who waved him by. But waved him by to go around and catch up? Or exactly what was he being told there? He will be waved to go ahead catch up to the back of the field. And stay on that lap. If, if Emerson had not stopped and got that indication from the pace car driver, he could have been black flagged and got a stop and go. So a wise move by our elder statesman. The view from the now quiet Robbie Gordon car back in the garage area as they begin to disassemble and uh, do a bit of an autopsy there to find out what the problems were that took Robbie Gordon off of a truly magnificent run. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, Rick Rice, our cameraman, showing you a trail of fluid that comes in behind Valvoline Cummins number nine. And uh, Robbie Gordon, you stand here. It was an engine problem, but boy, what a day. What a show you have put on. It started with the tire problem early, but the maturity that you seem to have displayed in recent races, working your way back up. Did you think you still had a chance to win this thing? I think we definitely had a shot at winning it. Um, I knew something was going on with the engine because I was pulling Emerson there pretty good when I was in third. And all of a sudden, he started closing the gap. About three laps later, she exploded in um, turn three and four. Got very lucky. I mean, it slid all the way down pit lane, and um, luckily didn't hit anything. But, you know, I got to give credit to these Valvoline guys. You know, they had an excellent pit stop, put me back on the lead lap, and uh, we were just having a great run. We're looking at a replay right now, and what a masterful job to keep it off the concrete. Did you surprise yourself that you kept it off the wall? Uh, you know, I was hoping we didn't take it onto the wall. You know, um, we got a test coming up next week, and we're trying to win IndyCar races right now. We can't afford any crashes. So, unfortunately, we would have jumped up in points a little bit, but we didn't. Um, you know, got to give thanks to all of our crew for just excellent pit stops all day long and Valvoline Cummins. Two saves today, one off the wall with the tire a bit earlier as well. Ah, you know the old saying, much rather be lucky than good. And you've got a new three-year extension on your contract in 97, too. I'm sure you're happy with that. Yeah, I really am. You know, um, I made that decision because the team was running so good all year long, and they've given me such a reliable car. It's really disappointing that we had an engine pop today. Thanks, Robbie. All right. That's not luck. That is skillful. He really kept that car off the wall. Oil pouring out from behind the car, under the rear tires, got her down on the pit road, and then still kept it off the wall. We're still under yellow. Focusing on the leader of the Marlboro 500 under yellow, Al Unser Jr. with Raul Boisel in second place. Now that Robbie Gordon had an engine go, something that we had a little bit of a prediction 
because uh, you saw that bit of a bobble that was probably the start of his engine going. And actually saw Emerson make a very easy pass into turn one, which surprised us a little bit. But then this happened. Listen. tries to control it, but there was too much oil out on that rear wheel. That racing team dodged a machine gun hail this year because he could have destroyed that car if he hit the wall. All right, this was the other question, and it's as we called it. Emerson Fittipaldi got to the blend line right there at the same time as the pace car. The blend line's actually back a little bit now as the pace car came in, but when they got to the line, they hit it simultaneously, so the officials decided to call it in favor of Emerson Fittipaldi. We're still under yellow, 48 laps complete. We're on the 188th lap. Roger Penske, will he be celebrating in the victory circle at his track? We talked at the beginning, Derek, about the punishment on the race cars here. It is quite phenomenal here, but I heard a very nice story that included the Penske team. They came here tested, and their push rods were not the man for the job. What did they do? They made them stronger, obviously, but they made a phone call to the Reynard company and said, by the way, these are the stresses that we have experienced. This is what you need to build your push rods to, and Reynard built their stronger. So although they're the competition, the safety of the drivers is what is paramount. How much do they stress the push rods to? 13,000 pounds of load is what they expect them to withstand. One of America's most recognized corporate symbols, the Goodyear blimp, hovers overhead providing aerial views of Michigan International Speedway and the surrounding Irish Hills here today. And those views do help tell us something about the race and the speeds of closure. Update on Scott Goodyear, Gary Gerald. Well, let's follow up. Remember that stop where he came in and the motor was quiet. We thought that he had run out of fuel. As it turned out, they took on 38 and a fraction gallons in that 40 gallon capacity. So there was fuel on board. They've determined, remember we told you about that shift indicator light that had malfunctioned on the dash. Apparently it got into the electronics and the gremlin spread and he was getting a false reading on his fuel that was left. So he's got a couple of problems there to contend with. That's what cost them so much time in the pit. And ironically, he did have fuel. It wasn't out. The machine caught and they're hoping that, that electronic gremlin doesn't resurface before the end of this race. Well, when you use microprocessors, that can happen. Here's Bill Ford, though. As we come back to the green flag, quite a gap from the front of the field back to the rest of the cars. Al Unser Jr. is the leader, and he's back in that group. Moving low, looking for racing room, and Ron Boisel is right there. And Willie T. Riggs with a slow car down the inside, but look at Boisel versus Al Jr. Raul Boisel was running faster than little Al coming into the last yellow flag session. Can he continue to run faster? Now the adjustments he made in the pit stop may be the key. They wound down that front end to get the more downforce. He's quick on turn four. Here we go. Raul Boisel moves for the lead of the Marlboro 500. And boy, he handles up but Al with no problem. So the guy that was faster earlier that had problems with the front end, they made a two-turn adjustment to both wings of the front end. He's Simon doing that. And boy, it made a world of difference. It's paid off right now as Raul is back in front and pulling away from Little Al. Dick Simon and his wife, they couldn't be happier. And Dick Simon had the frown earlier when Al Jr. made the pass, and now Pinsky has the frown. So Bozell is back in control. He's in contention. Does he deserve a win? We don't know. He's going to have to fight really hard here to fend off Al Jr. if he wins this in the Duracell car. One would presume the scenario here is one more pit stop to the end of the race. It's been a race punctuated by six yellow flags, so that will figure into the strategy on whether or not somebody wants to pit right on schedule or maybe try and hold just a little bit longer. Jan Vikas, you have an update. Well, when you're talking about Raul Boisel and you're talking about taking wing out of the front, that was what the big discussion was in the Penske camp. In other words, for Raul Boisel to pass in the way he did, it really helped him that he had less downforce. When you come in to change the handling, you always want to take downforce out. They were very fortunate that car was getting loose and not picking up a push. Third place, Emerson Fittipaldi. Front 
three cars very close together on this two mile super speedway. Good year is fourth. The first three cars, the only cars on the lead lap. They're right together. And if you listen very Marco Greco slows down. Oh, he was having a great run, was in eighth place. Brings lots of Brazilian sponsorship. Borden is the one that's on the side, bought a neat exporting business from Brazil to America. They had a great run today. Hopefully he's not finished, but it looks terminal. Very pleasant young man with a nice smile. The 71 car is Scott Sharp, and he pulls to the inside. That's in a precarious position. I assume we go yellow for that. Scott Sharp running in eighth place, had a big, big spin here just before qualifying on Friday. Scared him coming out of turn two, but he brings out a full course yellow. Yellow flag flies over Michigan as Marco Greco comes into the pits with obviously something seriously wrong, and the run at the Michigan 500 is interrupted once again, but Raul Boisel has gotten back to the front. Marlboro 500 in Michigan. I'm Paul Page with Derek Daly, Jan Bikas, and Gary Gerald covering from the pits as we are under our seventh yellow of the day. 197 laps are now complete. The leader of the race under the yellow is Raul Boisel, followed by Allinger Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi. Scott Goodyear is in fourth place, one lap down. In fifth place, three laps down, is Dominic Dobson, who had to acknowledge a passing the pace car penalty. They brought him into the pits for a stop and wait. He is back on the track once again. Ari Leyendijk, and by the way, stayed in fifth position. Ari Leyendijk runs in sixth place, followed by Teo Fabi, then Mark Smith, Hiro Mashushta, and until he fell out, which is the reason for this yellow, Scott Sharp was in 10th place. This rundown is two laps ago just before the yellow, but it does give you an idea of who is in and who is out and pretty close where they are. And as we wait to get a green flag, we have a tremendous race in prospect here. Lion Dyke following Mark Smith here, but the three leaders, Bozell and the two Penskys, are one behind the other. And with Bozell in front, as we watch both Scott Goodyear and Ari Lion Dyke come into the pits, Gary, I, I guess there is some tension down there. Well, let's find out from Dick Simon. How are the nerves right now? How much apprehension? Well, Gary, we're pretty excited. The whole team, actually, we feel that we deserve a win somewhere along the way. We've been trying so hard. The car is uh, being a little temperamental at the moment. Uh, that new bracket that we put on that Lola gave us just before the race is creating a little bit of nightmare. The car is pushing continually. The changes that we're making are making it uh, better, but it keeps going away on us and starts to push again. So if God's willing, help us make the right decision, maybe we can bring him home. You're going to change tire pressures, and of course you got, you're looking at one more stop. Now, when do you get in that window now for that final stop? Well, we'll get in that window in probably another 30 laps. Um, we'll be trying to, less than that actually, we'll be trying on that last step, stop to change the pressure in the left rear and the pressure in the right front to create a little bit more cross weight for him, giving a little more bite in the front, and then he can adjust the anti-roll bars inside the cockpit if that works. If it doesn't, I guess we can't say we didn't give it our best. All right, Dick Simon, we'll watch right along with you, and I know it's been a long wait. Maybe this will be the day. Thank you very much, Gary. Let's go to Jan. Well, Gary, talking about Dick Simon, it turns out that the Penske team right now are taking their cues from Dick Simon. They were going to come in if Raul Boisel pitted. They are queuing right now off Raul Boisel. Whatever Dick Simon does, then Roger Penske will follow. Obviously, Dick Simon put to rest what I had spoken about. I thought they were taking front wing out of Boisel's car. Of course, they're putting it in. So he does have a slower straightaway speed, but no, because now he can get through the corners quicker. He gets a higher speed coming off the turn, which is carrying all the way down into the end of the straight. And Penske just following one of the oldest rules in racing, follow the leader. Whatever exactly. he does, you do. He turns in, you turn in. The leader currently is Raul Boisel. Under yellow, Penske cars are second and third. We'll be back with more from Michigan. Well, if you can believe it, with seven different yellow flags affecting 55 laps, the average speed here is still 156.5 miles an hour. Ari Leyendijk, the 28 car, is in sixth position. We are still under a full course yellow. The most prestigious Formula 3 race in Europe used to be the Monaco Grand Prix. Now it's the Marlboro Masters in Zandvoort, Holland, and that is why 
Ari Leyendijk will bring this car for an IndyCar demonstration next week to his hometown, and they are waiting to see what an IndyCar sounds and looks like. Bill Cosby's driver, Willie T. Ribs. So much training in the Trans Am, now having to restyle his driving for the open wheel cars. Another driver for Derek Walker's team. On Moonlighting, as an actor, our boy Willie has now done several sessions on Cosby's new Mysteries television show, so he's working on his new career. Let's go to the pits, Jan Bikas. Well, while we have a moment, we can explain about those front wings. We've mentioned it so often. This is a Penske front nose box, and of course the wings stay covered because they like to keep them secret. But what we can see is how they adjust them. They put a little bit of fluorescent tape here, date glow tape, so that when they're doing it in a hurry and turning it, they can make sure it's either a half turn or a full turn that they're changing it. Right now, we have heard that a half turn here at Michigan makes a huge difference. It moves this, I believe, about 10, 20 thousandths of an inch. John, look, as long as you're there, just lift that cover off. We'd like to get a glimpse of what's there. No problem? Uh, well, I don't think I should because uh, Roger's kind of looking over my shoulder. <laughs> but uh, we'll try that another time, Paul. Okay. It'll be the last time you'll be allowed into the Penske pit. <laughs> they are so sensitive about it. Uh, I'm surprised you can get that close with the camera because you know, there's all kinds of intelligence work going on up and down these pits the whole time. Another interested spectator here this weekend is Derek Warwick from Formula One. Sits out this season. But he tells me he just has a burning desire to get back to racing full time, and he'd like that racing to be in IndyCar. Yeah, I talked to him, and he said he didn't realize how much it hurt not being in racing for that one year, and he would really, exactly what you said, he would really love to come over here. He's certainly looking up and down the pits. Still under yellow, the Marlboro 500. Back at the Marlboro 500 at Michigan at the 202nd lap, 57 of the laps today have been under yellow. We are still under yellow. We should be back to green shortly. Allens or Junior is very definitely making his presence felt at the back end of Raul's car. Raul, remember, as the leader of the race as we head back toward green, sets the pace coming to green, but the pace car is running very slow ahead of them, and they're going to get bottled up. Oh, they did get oh, bottled up. there's the flag. Boy, what a close call that may be. And Bozell was lucky that Al Jr. also made a run with him into turn three and had to back off on the pack suddenly descends, led by Teo Fabi behind Alan Sir Jr. If you were Raul, would you have taken that chance? Oh, yeah, but the problem is the pace car didn't anticipate just how slowly the pace car was running. Two, three, four, four. The pace car being driven, I believe, by John Cup. Got Goodyear as he moves around Emerson Fittipaldi. Now, that gets him back up a lap. Remember, he had all of his problems with the electronics that brought him into the pits, but the engine shut off. He came back one lap. He's still got a lap to gain if he can get around Boisel and get back on the later lap. He can get back in his fight. And great to see Goodyear showing his true form at last this season. It has not been a happy marriage. <laughs> the Bernstein team and Scott Goodyear. They will part and go separate ways next season. He is having a great run this afternoon. He is a super racing driver. Canadian was, by the way, the driving instructor for Paul Tracy years ago. Here comes Fittipaldi once again. Not a fight for position, just a fight for Goodyear in his lap. No point to him. Oh, side by side above 220 miles an hour with confidence. Your opposition and you can run side by side with confidence. Goodyear with the Ford engine comes up behind Emerson, but then you see Emerson stretch it as he goes through the banks of turns three and four. I saw one look like a pretty good bottom at the back of Goodyear's car going into that corner as well. We've seen a lot of that this afternoon, and I couldn't decide whether it was just a surface change that's got white marks on it or whether it was actually a fairly heavy bottom. At the Marlboro 500, with 206 laps of the 250-lap scheduled distance of 500 miles, Raul Boisel is the leader of the race. This car, Al Unser Jr., is trying to chase him down. We have just 44 laps to go on an afternoon that has been punctuated by seven different yellow flags. Robbie Gordon, the first to go yellow when he blew a tire, fell way back in the field, was able to keep the car going. 
and then was able to come back up to the front until finally he was out of the race totally. Nigel Mansell was leading. He's out of the race with a butterfly that's stuck in the engine. Michael Andretti was leading. He caught the wall. We've had a long, hard afternoon, and that's what the Michigan 500 is all about. Raul Boisel is now 2.3 seconds out in front of his nearest competitor, the Indy 500 champion, Alan Jr. And we know from what Dick Simon told us that the longer Boisel runs on a tank of fuel, the handling goes away. He gets the dreaded push. Alonso Jr. may know that because he chased him for so long the last time. But right now we have Ford versus Ilmore. A lot of people believe here that the Ford has more horsepower here than the Ilmore, but very few Bit of Baldi, and that looks like a motor. That is an engine. Very few people would argue that the Penske goes through corners here better than everybody. Roger Penske getting the word. Now he'll relay on. He should be on the radio only with little Al. Though I assume Roger can slip over and cover any channel. But if you're talking about the power plant battle that we talked about at the start of the day, there's an Ilmore. This is terminal. When you see smoke like that, you immediately see the driver unbuckle his belts because he probably heard the dreaded mechanical mix-up of the engine parts. And now it's all over. So out of third place, Emerson Fittipaldi won his first race here in the Indy cars in 1985. Was that speed chasing tail Bobby and just that quickly it's over. Uh, Morpheus, the Pac West car just ducks away from that oil smoke being thrown out by Fittipaldi. But one of Al Jr.'s championship contenders falls by the wayside. Yeah, let us do consider the championship points and what that does with Michael Andretti out. Now Fittipaldi out in the race. There are 10 cars, so Fittipaldi can still pick up a point or two, depending on how the rest of this race runs, but it's going to adversely affect both their runs in the championship. Little Al is still in this fight, and he is whittling away on Raul Boisel. Willie T. ripped in for a stop. Uh, now, as we watch Willie T, it is a terrific two-way fight. Scott Goodyear now moves up to third place. Emerson hasn't dropped off the leaderboard yet, but that now elevates Dobson line like Bobby Marksman on Tuesday. Are all in the top ten, and they all benefit from Emerson's troubles. So Willie T in tenth place, back into the fight. Chuck Craig talks with his driver, Emerson Fittipaldi. Craig has been fairly vocal lately. He was quite angry when it was suggested that Robbie Gordon said that the Penske had traction control. Proud man, if we don't have it, we wouldn't do it. We follow the rules. Quick update on speed of the leading cars. Bozell's last lap, 226.6. Al Jr., 226.5. They are almost perfectly matched at the moment. John Vickers, you have Emerson now? Yes, we are standing by with Emerson. Emerson, you're so close to the end. Was it the engine like now? Yeah, that's a shame. The car was really handled well. I was a little stuck in the last three start, but I was able, uh, if I would pass, uh, they would catch uh, Junior. My car was flying. Now tell me, we are close to the end of the race. We know you run a fifth and a sixth gear. Had you already gone to fifth to try and run them down, or were you in sixth? No, I was going to go sixth now. On the restart, I was in fifth. So now, what do you say to Al Junior? Because he's near the end. He's close to the lead. Would you now advise him with your engine not to go down to fifth gear to try and run down? No, okay. that doesn't make any difference. Only on the red is different. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Emerson. Okay. Fittipaldi, no advice for Al Hunter Jr. Let him drive his own race. The gearing between fifth and sixth, really more of a wind condition kind of gearing than anything else would be there. Yes, indeed. Sometimes they call it a cruiser gear, but with 100 revs difference, you can just get into a different power band. But Unser Jr. has begun to turn it up on Jr. because look at that last lap above 227 miles an hour as the laps go on they still get even faster they brought him three tenths of a second closer to this man royal Raul Boisel. and very definitely in contact the battle for the lead is on again and two years ago we all remember Bozell literally in tears at the indianapolis 500 when he believed he had everything to win the race he was penalized, and he was taken out of the fight. He was in the clear, and we believe that should have been his race. Now he is in the fight of his life without Jr. A little loud, closes 
Bulls last lap 227.8 compared to Boisel's 226.9. get a speed lap after lap, helping track the motion. This is Alonso Jr.'s favorite chassis. Shelly continues to take notes on times and gaps, but this is Alan Jr.'s favorite carries in. Chassis number 007. Yes, it's one the same car that he won the Indianapolis 500 with. Nick Simon and his son talk over strategy for this car. Raul Boisel, they are not in contact. Very, very careful to keep track of the cars on the course while we watch them with this good action as well. Don't want to cover one with the other. Back with more right after this. Today at 5:30 p.m. Eastern here on ESPN, the Senior PGA Northville Long Island Classic from Meadowbrook Club in Jericho, New York. Lee Trevino and Jay Singler tied at nine under. They're playing for a purse of six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The Senior PGA today on ESPN at 5:30 Eastern. Two laps are complete. The final pit stops do just any time now, probably within the next four laps. Allinger Jr. trying to close on Raul Boisel. Got to about a minute or a second and a half behind Raul and then kind of just got stopped right there, Jan. What do you expect? Well, we will see Allinger Jr. here in four laps. So now that the signal, three laps with Allinger Jr. I checked in with Richard Buck, who's the crew chief for Al Jr. I said, are you running flat out? He says, no. What we're doing, we're just keeping Raul in sight, and we hope to put him in front because of a quicker pit stop. Gary, you got more? Well, indeed we do, because they're plotting strategy down here, and it involves a somewhat complicated change. They're gambling a bit, the Dick Simon crew, because they say now that they're going to make an adjustment on the back of the car. They may sacrifice and not change the left front oh, tire. Oh, what oh, happened here? Sorry. Raul Boisel slows down, and all of a sudden, Dick Simon's on the radio to him. He's listening. Spoke at the back of the engine. It's over. Oh, no. Unbelievable. Your words were just expressed again by Dick Simon. Boisel's day looks like incredibly it's over. Lord Cosworth power plant. We've seen an Elmore go in the last few laps in Fittipaldi's hands. We now see this one. Allinger Jr. picks up the lead with his Elmore. And a fire, that's a turbocharger fire in the back. They should be able to spray that right out. Yeah, but the reason that catches fire is because there's lots of oil in there. And Bozell is probably on the radio right now to Dick, telling him the noises that he heard on that back straight. And this is Terminal Bozell is probably close to tears. If a man ever deserved to win. But Al Jr. was turning the heat up because Al Jr. had just turned the fastest lap of the race two laps earlier at about 229 miles an hour. Straps and climbs out at the Marlboro 500. Once again, it will not be Dick Simon's day. Gary Gerald. Now we're trying to get position in the chaos here because they were throwing a lot of equipment. Dick Simon, I, I hate to ask you, but what is the emotion right now? Because it, I know that disappointment just must wretch through your body. It really does. Um, we just lost an engine, Gary. Oh, my. You know, it's a shame because. Uh, Three or four times this year, we should have done good. And the car was good, needed a couple of minor changes, but I think we would have went out to win. You had all their respect today, I know that. Let's go to Jan. Well, while you had the disappointment there, Gary, you had the elation here. Allinger Jr. in for his final stop. Man, that was quick. Allinger Jr., well, I haven't seen a quicker stop here today. And of course, they didn't really need it now with Boisel dropping out. 12 seconds for Allinger Jr.'s stop. Routine and smooth. That brings Scott Goodyear into second place. How, how, how close do you have to come? But look now what happens here. Scott Goodyear 
is in second place. If anything should happen to Alonso Jr., Goodyear, who is now on the lead lap, brings his car down for the last pit stop. But I have to just tell you, I feel so badly for Dick Simon. We clearly heard there the man could hardly speak, and Bozell wonders what you have to do to try and finally win. His only victory has come here. Scott Goodyear makes his final stop of this Marlboro 500. Let's go to Gary. He throws the water bottle out of the cockpit. Chris Griffiths and the company complete the tire change. Still not done with the fueling. That's a little surprising. Now they're ready to roll 16 plus seconds, Paul. The gravity flow that the Indy cars use takes a little longer. The, the fuel goes down in the tank. Al Unter Jr. is the leader. Raul Boisel's clear of his car. And little Al is now a full lap ahead of second place, Scott Goodyear. Dominic Dobson in third place. What a great run for Pac West. Ari Leyendyke in fourth. We said there are some surprises here. Some interesting names at the top of the order. And Michael Andretti made the classic comment before this race ever started. This historically is survival of the fittest. There's Dominic Dobson and Ari Leyendyke in what is a fight for position. Leyendyke started 26, and Little Al's in trouble! Little Al's in trouble! Scott Goodyear is about to lead this race. We suggested that if Fittipaldi had the problem, could Al have it too? The Ilmore has let go now in Little Al's car. Here with just 20 laps to go. The lead changes, then changes again as the leaders fall out. How can you absorb the emotional roller coaster here? Al Jr. was almost a lap down at Indy, and Emerson blew up and handed it to him. Listen to the crowd scream at the chase. And they go yellow. They go to a full course yellow. Apparently, they're worried about oil on the track when little Al's engine let go. So Scott Goodyear will assume the lead. This man, Dominic, Dominic Dobson, will go into second place. Ari Leyendyke, who started back in 28th, runs in third. Teo Fabi is up to fourth. Mark Smith is up to fifth. The yellow flag comes out. Let's go to Gary. Well, I suppose that this turn of events now, as you just saw, little Al go by, makes the disappointment all that more acute. What is it going to take, Raul, for you to finally win one of these things? I don't know. Uh, Will he led most of the race? It's a big disappointment. I thought I have uh, I have uh, a good a good chance. I was running a good pace. A little while put a little pressure. You know I respond. And uh, I don't know. The car was running fine. Uh, everything was was perfect. You know I was making a good pace. Were you getting your hopes up, realizing the end was drawing closer and closer? Yeah, you know, for sure I thought it has a good chance, you know, uh, it was in the bag. Uh, I need to keep the pace was running to to finish ahead of uh, Al, so, and uh, unfortunately it wasn't to be, I guess. Thank you, Raul. We're disappointed. We go to Jan. Alan Sir Jr. is just debriefing here with Roger Penske, and he was actually smiling. How Boy, that was a tough day, but you managed to smile even in the event of that engine blowing. First of all, what did you think when you saw Raul's blow? You thought it was obviously your day. Well, you know, I was, I was real happy that uh, the Raul engine blew. You know, we were going to have a really good race. It was, it was a shame for the fans, really, because, um, you know, we had a lap up on everybody, and and so you know, you don't know what was going to happen. So, um, but you know, now we blow up. Now it's probably a good race out there. I don't know. Were you running flat out, or did you back off a little when you knew that you no longer were in contention with Raul? No, I started lifting a little. Made you know, I richened the engine up and uh, you know turned the boost down because we had a lap lead. I started backing off a little bit, and you know, Roger told me all I really needed to run was you know 215 to 217, and uh, and that was it. And uh, and so that's what I was doing. I was just cruising, really, when it blew. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Paul? So Al Enzer Jr. out of the run. And now Scott Goodyear, who won here before, is the leader here at the Marlboro 500. His wife, Leslie, as the Canadians, very close to the border here, begin to cheer.
Back at the Marlboro 500 at Michigan, they continue to work on Marco Greco's car. He's running in 11th place, but he's well behind the lead. They've been working on it for a very long time. This man, the 40 Budweiser car of Scott Goodyear, is the leader of the race and the leader by a full lap. He inherited the lead when Al Unger Jr. had the engine let go right after Raul Boisel had his engine go as the leader of the race. Four different leaders have fallen out while leading. We're back to green. This should be a dash to the finish. 233 laps complete, 250 the scheduled distance. I'm sure Scott Goodyear himself can hardly believe what's happening here. Perhaps John Dick's magical sun setup that he wanted Goodyear to try will prove beneficial. Now he's had lots of help with the attrition rate. We're glad to take a win whatever way you can get him. If Goodyear can just finish his last 16 laps. Scott Goodyear once again proving his 500 mile legs. His only victory came here two years ago. Then driving for Derek Walker. There's some speculation that he might end up next year with Derek Walker's team once again. So he is clear at the moment. We'll follow his Lap speed, last lap was above 216 miles an hour. Fastest lap of the day, 222. That's seven miles an hour slower than the lead car, but Leyendijk, who we may have a triumphant return to Holland, bringing this Indy car. Come off a tremendous result. Started 28, now runs in second. The first and second driver, remember, all know what it's like to win 500-mile races as Sal and Candela, team owner and manager, takes the stopwatch. I bet he's checking his heartbeat, not lying by time. Third place is Dominic Thompson. Back west, a nice result thus far. Like the car bottomed again. We've seen that several times today off a number of different cars. Send your heart right up in your chest every time you see it. To be right about where that surface change, that's Teo Fabi in the Reynard, the Penn's oil car right ahead of Leyendijk. Leyendijk knows he's not a good threat to catch Scott Goodyear, so Leyendijk's focus really must be on staying ahead of Dominic Dobson in that Pac West car. Right now we have seven cars still in competition. 1986, we finished with only seven. Same thing in 91. More to the fact that this race eats up race cars. Lion Dyke makes the move on Bobby. Not for position, of course, just another lap down for Tail. Again, I think we saw that car bottom out as we move up to Dominic Dobson. What a run Dobson is finally having. Actually had a great qualifying run, qualifying night outside Road 3, Ford engine. We see no sponsorship on this car. Bruce McCaw, one of the owners, chasing sponsorship. Bruce Sullivan in on Tuesday just to see where they are with their road racing testing. But this man is doing them proud this afternoon because he is surviving. And it is survival of the fittest. A rookie in this race, the fastest rookie, Teo Fabi, the fourth place car. His laps have not been all that spectacular recently, down at 209 miles an hour, his top of the race at 219. So he never was truly in contention, but staying in the race through attrition has paid off for Jim Hall's car here, the Pennzoil Special, driven by tail. Good look at that grouping and Hebrew front wing setup that Adrian Reynard uses on these cars. Fabi, who, believe it or not, still commutes from Italy for each one of these races. Bobby was second in 1989. Here's a wonderful story. First Smith ever in any 500 is in fifth place right now. Again, he stayed with it, persevered throughout the day. Terrific result for young Mark Smith. Quite an aviator, very nice guy. We followed his toys at Indianapolis many, many times when he failed to qualify. Bumped out of the field two years ago, didn't make it again this year. Turned that car upside down, trying to qualify at Toronto two weeks ago. Jeroma Schuster runs in sixth. Remember, he had an accident, broke a leg in Indianapolis several years ago, and has never seemed to pick his stride up since that time. 
It's interesting what a wreck and an injury can do to you. But he's becoming a lot well known, a lot better known on television in Japan. And now television over here because recently he just filmed a Northwest Airlines commercial, which will be shown in Japan and of course on the Japanese televisions here in the States. Willie T. Ribs, the teammate to Mark Smith. You mentioned he's doing some Cosby appearances. Parker Johnstone also doing an appearance. He's in the movie Speed. Let's watch it, see if you can figure out the party plays. Well, whatever the party plays, here's a man that will go to a party tonight. He just took a week off, went to a cabin on the lakes in Canada, trying to rest and relax a little bit. But what an afternoon he may have to tell his young son, Christopher. who will have a new addition to the family recently, his wife, Leslie, who you saw earlier on. Bought a new horse, a dressage horse. Part two. Indianapolis resident, very shorty. His wife Leslie actually competes in dressage and looks forward to that new mount. No one in contest at the moment. They're running laps out. Boy, he bottomed again as he came through there. Number of cars we've seen bottoming, Young Bigas. Jan? What we, what we have seen, Paul, is that the air is getting more dense. We've had cloud cover. The sun has gone away. As the air gets more dense, these cars create more downforce. They suck down onto the ground. That's where those little puffs of smoke, you're actually seeing smoke from the bottom of the car rubbing on the race track because the air is getting more dense. After the Marlboro 500 here, the Indy cars are back to the road courses for one run at the Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. And we'll have coverage on ABC Sports of that event two weeks from today. And they were quick glimpses of John Dick, who along with Dave Benbo, are responsible for the way this car goes to the line of the setup that's been on it. What a frustrating year Benbo has been there all year. And John Dick have had time to get success from this Budweiser Lola. But as Bobby Gordon said earlier on, I'd rather be looking than good any day. You see the bottom out again. Will Scott Brooks here win another 500 mile race at Michigan? You know, there's a danger of triteness in this, but I think it absolutely applies here. Here's a driver with four laps to go, one lap fully in the lead. He's seen everything that's gone before in this race today. He's won here once. He's got to be listening to and hearing everything that's happening in that car. Coming up next, the USDA and U.S. Curtis Cup. USA is leading in this international competition 5-4 between the teams from Scotland, Ireland, and Great Britain. Bill McGill and Sarah LeBron Ingram lead the U.S. team live here on ESPN. That's coming up next. Three laps to go, about a minute and a half. And Scott Goodyear will have notched his second IndyCar victory, both of them, here at the Michigan 500. He's only started here four times. Marco so Greco slows down. They shouldn't go yellow in the last 10 laps. Now he's keeping the car running. At least he's back into the fight. Marco's like 54 laps behind the lead of the race, running 11. He'll work his way up because he's actually running behind cars that have already fallen out. So back to Scott Goodyear, Kenny Bernstein, who has made so many changes trying to find the harmony that front-running teams and successful teams need. Brought in Montermany to do two road races at Cleveland. Again, he bought him down. I hope that's okay. Brought in Montermany to do Cleveland and Toronto. Back to Goodyear for this one event. And Scott Goodyear will have chills up and down his spine. He could never have imagined, as Leslie watches, that he, this type of success could have fallen his way today. Under 30 seconds away from his second win, and a win at the Marlboro 500. His name on the Dana Trophy already won. Will it go again? Boy, it sure looks that way. The man who perseveres wins. A final couple of bottomings. Third turn, fourth turn. Scott Goodyear sees the twin checkered flags from Jim Swintall, and the Budweiser car with Scott Goodyear has taken the win in the Marlboro 500. He'll be followed to the line by Ari Leyendijk and Dominic Dobson. Today's coverage of the Indy cars on ESPN has been brought to you by the Valvoline Performance Team. By Mazda. Mazda, it just feels right. And by cold-filtered Miller Genuine Draft. 
Get out of the old, get into the cold. The Canadian flag flies for a Canadian winner, his second time here. Unofficial results, Scott Goodyear, Ari Leyendijk, Dominic Dobson, as we'll look down through the entire rundown in a long, hard-fought battle in which the man who persevered took the checker, and that was Scott Goodyear. Mario Andretti had such a great run going in his last 500 and then fell out at the edge of the race course. There's the entire order of the 28 that have started, unofficial order of finish. And what is that going to do to the points? Well, we're still closing. Michael Andretti, Emerson Fittipaldi sit in second and third, just behind Al Unter Jr. Not much change in the top three positions of the points. But what a celebration for Scott Goodyear, who has taken the win here today, Gary Gerald. Helmet off, second time in your career, same place. You saw four leaders in front of you find misfortune today and here you are tell us what this moment feels like well, I'll tell you it just feels great because uh, for right now it's been a tough year for everybody but I have to thank everybody in the Budweiser crew the guys did some great stops and uh, I'm ready for a Budweiser I'll tell you congratulations we're out of time but a terrific win your second celebrate and enjoy yeah, we are we're thanking you thank you so with a long day Scott Goodyear takes the win he stayed in there the points remain pretty much the same and the Indy cars now head off in two weeks to the Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. Lots of racing this week here on ESPN as we head off for the Brickyard 400 as well. I'm Paul Page for Derek Daly. Jan Bikas and Gary Gerald. Congratulations to Scott Goodyear. And thanks for joining us here at the Marlboro 500 at Michigan.